you don't like death? Metal Gear Solid is an incredibly important series to me. They started out as these fun games with interesting writing, incredible levels of polish, super unique gameplay, and lots of fun fourth wall breaks, but they've become so much more for me. As I dug deeper into the series, I actually managed to find something like an identity for myself in these games. From the moment I started this channel over four years ago, I knew that someday I would do a video on Metal Gear Solid 2. It was a super important game to me, and I was essentially just waiting until I had gotten good enough at making these videos that I was ready, worthy of making that video. Well, eventually I did. I spent several months working on the script, whereas I usually only took a few days back then. I played through the game countless times, practically memorizing every single codec call and cutscene, and it all led to what I still think is one of the best videos on this channel. Even as my editing, writing, and production quality has gotten significantly better over the years. But that's not what's so important about that video to me. What's important about that video is this line. Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly important to me, and as a result, I'm going to talk about myself in this outro more than I typically do on this channel. To people who have seen enough of my videos, that line probably sounds ridiculous. These videos are very clearly just as much about myself as they are the topics I'm covering. That's what makes my channel unique, and at times, alienating, but it's what the channel is, and this video is when it became that. This video, or more specifically Metal Gear Solid 2 itself, is what made my channel this way. And considering that this channel is almost definitely the biggest footprint I'll ever leave in this life, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that this series helped me define my life. I'll put this out there right now. While we're going to be covering the vast majority of Metal Gear lore, this is not a lore video by any means. Rather than just looking at lore, we're pretty much just going to be looking at these games the same way that your English teacher wanted you to look at Siddhartha. I've made a standalone video on almost every Metal Gear Solid game that Kojima directed. Some of those videos I think are fantastic, others feel a little bit pointless. Here's the thing though, while I'm super proud of videos like these three and think that they can stand on their own without relying on each other to fill in the gaps, Metal Gear Solid as a whole is about much more than the games are individually. The series is so much more than the sum of its parts. Metal Gear is a story about love and deterrence and life and family, sure, but beyond even that, it's a story about art and thought and emotion and feeling, and at the very bottom of the rabbit hole, Metal Gear is a series about <laughs> existence. As I was writing this, I was looking at a 25,000 word script for a whole series analysis on Metal Gear. I wrote it about two years ago, and I've been sitting on it ever since. Committing to a single video that's several hours long isn't really financially or creatively viable for me, so I've decided to split this up into multiple parts. Ultimately, if you watch these videos in order, you'll understand a story that goes so far beyond the Snake family, and so far beyond the literal narrative of the games. This is going to be one big story cut up into five parts, not five separate stories. Anyways, this is the Metal Gear Solid 1 part of the story. Metal Gear has followed a whole lot of traditions throughout its development. It can be something as iconic as using a box to hide from enemies, to something as subtle as the player always heading north as they complete their objectives, to something as memorable as the series' bleeding heart view of nuclear armament, to something as random as claymores becoming invisible after they've planted. These games are really connected in their ideas and themes, so to get a better idea of where it all started, where all these ideas were fathered from, we need to look at Metal Gear and Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. We won't spend too much time here, because there isn't much to talk about that we won't be covering in the rest of the series. More than anything, I just want to establish now to unfamiliar players that these games do exist. Just like Metal Gear Solid, they have the corny boss fights and cartoony stealth and the preachy, heavy-handed monologue about war and the nature of soldiers. Lore-wise, all we really need to know is that this soldier named Big Boss created a mercenary nation called Outer Heaven because he was tired of being left without a purpose for existing after his war ended, and wanted to essentially create a military-industrial complex so that he and other washed-up soldiers in the world could have a purpose again. Solid Snake infiltrates Outer Heaven, kills Big Boss, destroys a weapon called Metal Gear, and makes it out alive. Then, in the second game, the exact same thing happens. A soldier named Big Boss creates a mercenary nation, Solid Snake takes him down, yada yada yada, only this time, Outer Heaven is called Zanzibar Land. 
Like I said, I won't be getting too into those two games here in the beginning, but we're going to see a whole lot of references to these games over the course of the series, both blatant and extremely subtle. So, again, just know that they exist. Now, Metal Gear Solid 1. Much like Metal Gear 2 was basically a reimagining of Metal Gear 1, Metal Gear Solid 1 is a reimagining of Metal Gear 2, only this time with advanced 3D graphics, high quality voice acting, and state of the art cutscenes. We've got the inexplicably invisible claymores, we've got bombs planted in our inventory, we've got fistfights with Frank Yeager, aka Grey Fox, aka Cyborg Ninja, we've got betrayals and weapons R&D scientists teaching us about robots, we've got Snake getting more powerful with each boss he kills, fights against tanks and high Ds, we've got the same pistol, SMG, grenade stinger, RC missile, landmine, weapon set, it even gets as specific as having two towers towards the northern end of the facility, with a scene where guards chase us up seemingly endless stairs, and another where your female companion is taken down when you attempt to cross a long, linear path in a way that blocks you from progressing, forcing you to backtrack for an item so that you can get past the new obstacle. I could go on and on, but you get the point. The similarities between these games are uncanny, and very deliberate. So why? Why use all of this exciting new technology to essentially just tell the same type of story you already told twice by this point? Well, in reality, it's probably just that Kojima liked the concept and wanted to do as much with it as possible, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. At least, I feel like it does. To start off, let's talk about what Metal Gear Solid 1 is really all about. It's a lot easier to pin down than the other games in the series. Basically, it's about genes, and what they mean to creatures as complicated as humans. From the very beginning, we have Kazuhira Miller telling us about how Alaskan field mice eat the offspring of other Alaskan field mice in order to ensure that their own genes live on. We have Dr. Naomi Hunter constantly talking about the Human Genome Project and her motivations in becoming a geneticist, and how she feels that she can determine who she is and what she should be doing with her life if only she could crack her own genetic code. Then we've got the late game reveal that Solid Snake, Liquid Snake, and every single one of these genome soldiers was essentially made with Big Boss's DNA. Solid and Liquid are pretty much clones of Big Boss, and the genome soldiers have had extensive gene therapy exposing them to over 40 soldier genes that Big Boss carried. You've got Psycho Mantis talking about his rocky relationship with his father being the reason for his hatred of humanity, the fox die virus specifically becoming lethal in people who have the genetic patterns it was programmed to attack, and tons, tons more. Hell, the last thing we see before Snake rides off into the sunset is a caribou with its child. Genes are absolutely everywhere in this game. So, okay, these are all things that are relevant to the gene discussion, but what does the game actually have to say about any of this stuff? Well, basically, the game is about learning not to obsess over your genes. I mean, think about it. The antagonist of the game, Liquid Snake, is doing everything he can to surpass his father out of hatred for both his supposedly cursed genes and the world that his father's generation left behind. Solid Snake, on the other hand, doesn't even know for sure that Big Boss was his father until the end of the game. I don't have any family. No. Wait. There was a man who said he was my father. He doesn't obsess over his genes like Liquid does, and so he doesn't feel as if he's been cursed since birth. Liquid keeps saying that he only exists because he was necessary to adopt all of the recessive genes so that Solid Snake could get all of the dominant genes and be the superior clone. But as Ocelot reveals in the post credit scene, Liquid was in fact the dominant clone, but Solid Snake beat him in the end anyways. Turns out your genes don't determine your fate. This is a concept that carries over to almost every character in the game. Otacon's greatest mistake was following his father and his grandfather's legacy of creating weapons. Meryl tries to become a soldier so that she can understand her father better, ultimately realizing that she isn't cut out for this stuff. We'll get back to that when we talk about MGS4. All of Psycho Mantis's trauma stems from his childhood fear of his abusive father, but in his final moments he learns that he shouldn't have allowed his father's cruelty to warp his perception of humanity. Sniper Wolf obsesses over her past, seeking revenge on the world after the death of her father figure, Big Boss. Naomi becomes a biologist specifically so that she could understand herself by learning of her family history, only to learn that her non-biological relationship with Grey Fox was more important in the end. Vulcan Raven spends all of his screen time talking about the culture and history of his people, ultimately to fall, just as Liquid did. 
Hell, Mei Ling is only kind of a character in this game, but even she introduces herself by talking about her Chinese-American heritage, and how she's reconciled it by reading plenty of literature from both America and China. Above all else, though, every single one of the soldiers we see in this game was injected with Big Boss's DNA, and so, because they were essentially created out of an obsession over genes, they're all bound to succumb to Fox Die. So what exactly is Fox Die? Well, it turns out that Snake was infected by Naomi with a virus called Fox Die, which was made specifically to target the genetic code of the terrorists and a couple of other key players, and cause their hearts to fail. This was done so that Metal Gear could be retrieved safely without having to nuke Shadow Moses. But think about that again. It's a disease that specifically knows who to kill by seeking their genetic code, their genes, doomed to die because of what they were born as. In the first truly abstract moment in the Metal Gear series, Snake isn't killed by Fox Die. We're told that he has the exact same genetic code as Liquid Snake, and he was exposed to Fox Die hours before Liquid was, but Fox Die kills Liquid and seemingly doesn't have any effect on Snake. Naomi, by this point in the game, realizes that her genes don't determine who she is. She was, in her own words, looking for a reason to live through her genes, rather than just living. And that's the advice she gives to Snake. Snake asks her how long it's going to take for him to be killed by Fox Die, and rather than giving him a straight answer, she tells him to just live. Snake doesn't need to worry about Fox Die, about his genes. He needs to just be. He needs to live in the moment instead of focusing on his past and his inception. He needs to move past his own generational trauma, lest he succumb to the same fate that every other character obsessed with their heritage was doomed to. The lesson of Metal Gear Solid 1 is to not let your past define you. You need to live in the moment and know yourself for who you are, not who you were or where you came from. That obsession with the past leads to you getting nowhere in life. It leads to you being defeated by your recessive twin and killed by your own genes. Not yet, Snake! It's not over yet! This is Metal Gear, however, and you can't spell Metal Gear without meta. This is not where I move on to MGS2 just yet. A lot of people don't like Kojima's self-destructive motifs. Plenty of lifetime Metal Gear fans hate on MGS4 and V for coming across as so cynical towards the series, while others say that that's the whole point of those games. I say something a little bit different, but we'll save that for later. People say that that angle is just an excuse that Kojima superfans make up to excuse him losing passion for the series. I'll be real, the final years of the Metal Gear series do tend to leave a bad taste in my mouth too, but Kojima's examination of the fact that the series was getting, well, repetitive has been around for as long as Metal Gear Solid has, and it didn't always take such a self-destructive form. That critical examination of the Metal Gear formula has always been there, but back then it was done through a much more hopeful lens. I introduced Metal Gear Solid 1 by saying that it felt like it was more of a reimagining of Metal Gear 2 than a wholly original game. You've got very similar game mechanics, with very similar gameplay and pop progression, very similar set pieces and boss fights and so forth, only in 3D this time. Like I just said, however, Metal Gear Solid is a series all about learning to not obsess over your past and to not let your past define you, but that's exactly what Metal Gear Solid did. It let itself be defined by what Metal Gear already was. Well, with Metal Gear 2 being a game that feels more like a definitive version of Metal Gear 1 than its own game, and Metal Gear Solid feeling more like a remake of Metal Gear 2, I would imagine that any creator, Kojima included, would have wanted to move on to some other series by now. And that's exactly what Metal Gear Solid is all about, from this meta perspective at least. It seems to me like it's Kojima saying, and what he thought would be his last Metal Gear game, I'm not going to let my most successful game so far define me. I'm going to move on and create another great thing, rather than more of the previous great thing. Only, well, he wouldn't get to move on to a new series for about 20 years with Death Stranding. Kojima, much like Liquid, Mantis, Raven, Wolf, Ocelot, Naomi, Otacon, Meryl, the Genome Soldiers, Mei Ling, would be doomed to being defined by his past up until the series' brutal, unceremonious ending in 2015, when he finally got to move on to something new. It was nothing. Huh. All clear. Huh? 
Metal Gear Solid 2 is an extremely complicated game. It can best be summed up by this moment and the ending. Didn't I tell you that GW was still incomplete? But not anymore, thanks to you. See, Emma never actually said that. The game is taking advantage of how physically and mentally exhausted we are by the plot twists and all the intense gameplay of the finale to brainwash us into accepting this contradiction that the game feeds us as fact. Raiden's subjective experience, a tapestry of memories, simply doesn't align with the facts we're being presented with. And that's what Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty is all about. Fact versus opinion. Canon versus headcanon. The viewer versus the author. I'll make a point now of saying that I don't mean to speak for Kojima. Everything you've heard in the previous video and everything you're going to hear for the rest of this series is just me projecting myself onto Kojima through his games. If I were in his shoes, that's how I would feel, and if I had made Metal Gear Solid 1, that's what I would have meant by it. That's all that this series is. It's very important that you understand that now. I don't want to speak for somebody that I've never met. I'm speaking for myself here. So, assuming that Metal Gear Solid 1 is something along the lines of a game creator declaring that he felt he had done all he needed to do with the series, then Metal Gear Solid 2 is a big fat letter on that game creator's desk, which reads, we need more Metal Gear. Metal Gear Solid 2 is a whole lot of things to me. I already brought up in the previous video how that game has defined my life in some way, as weird as that is to say about a game where this happens. What? I'm going to go in my pants? Nobody's looking, right? It's the most blatantly meta game in the series. It's the game whose themes and messages resonate the hardest with me. It's the game that defined in relatively clear terms what Metal Gear was really about. MGS2 was, for a long time, my favorite work of art. It's difficult for me to even think about writing about this game again, because I feel like I captured everything I wanted to say, incredibly comprehensively, exactly how I wanted to say it three years ago, when I was just starting out on this platform. Like I said, even all these years later, I still think it's in my top 10 videos. However, I have grown substantially as a creator since then, and more to the point, in that video I was just talking about MGS2. Here, I'm talking about Metal Gear as a whole, and so I've got a whole lot of things to say that I wouldn't have really needed to in my original MGS2 video. As with Metal Gear Solid 1, we're going to start with a more surface level analysis and slowly dive into the deeper and more meta concepts. Don't worry, I'll be quicker about this than I was in my original MGS2 video. At least a little bit. I'll be real, as I was writing this, I was halfway through having a panic attack at the thought of opening up this can of worms again. So let's start with something relatively simple. What actually happens in the game? MGS1 story is pretty simple, but 2's needs a bit of clarification if you don't have all the patience for long cutscenes and a plot with more twists than is probably reasonable, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page going forward. This plot is so full of twists, in fact, that we should probably start from the ending and work our way backwards. Basically, this world's equivalent to the Illuminati, the Patriots, created an AI that was designed to run the world, called GW, and by the time of MGS2, it had learned after the genome soldier experiment in MGS1 that you can't replicate a perfect soldier, Big Boss, by just copying his genes. What's more important than genes are ideas and experiences. So they took a child soldier who had repressed his past, Raiden, and tried to engineer a life that would make him become as great of a soldier as Solid Snake was. They gave him a girlfriend specifically designed to match his preferences, both to monitor him and to stop him from questioning anything. This was all designed as a test for the S3 plan, Selection for Societal Sanity. The AI's main fear for humanity was that, in the information age brought on by the internet, every fact would be buried by an endless flood of opinions being posted and shared online, and the truths of our time wouldn't be preserved for future generations. So S3 was essentially a method of filtering information in a way that would prioritize the truth over endless, uneducated, and emotionally charged opinions. Kind of like the antithesis of modern social media algorithms, designed to show us things that enrage us in order to keep us engaged out of spite. However, GW is more or less taken down before the S3 plan can be pushed to the public, and so all we get to see is their test of the system, Raiden's life. Basically, GW doesn't really care about getting another soldier as good as Snake. They instead want to see if the S3 plan was powerful enough to transform Raiden, a child soldier who fought endlessly for no reason, into Solid Snake, a hero who, by the end of MGS1, was driven by passion rather than his orders. 
they essentially wanted to see if their program was powerful enough to replicate Solid Snake's character arc in a man who was nothing like him at all. And so we have the Big Shell exercise. Everything that Raiden experiences in MGS2 was a staged terrorist act designed to mimic the conditions of Shadow Moses to see if Raiden would prevail in the same way that Snake did. Solidus was chosen to be a stand-in for Liquid Snake because his prior relationship with Raiden mirrors that of Solid and Liquid Snake. The boss fight lineup, Dead Cell, is described as the biggest group of freaks outside of Foxhound. Foxhound, by the way, is the group that Revolver Ocelot, Vulcan Raven, Psycho Mantis, Liquid Snake, Decoy Octopus, and Sniper Wolf belong to in MGS1. In terms of the connections between the various members of Dead Cell and the members of Foxhound, it's a little bit fuzzy. Every one of them seems to connect to multiple others in different ways. Vamp, for instance, has a boss arena that perfectly mimics that of Revolver Ocelot in the first game, but he also leaves claymores everywhere he goes in the same way that Vulcan Raven did. But then Fat Man also plants explosives all over Big Shell. Fortune, for another example, forces you to take her on while not being able to get in close enough to fight her hand to hand, like Sniper Wolf, but she also dodges your attacks perfectly like Psycho Mantis. The connections are all over the place, but the game literally tells us that Dead Cell was chosen as a stand-in for Foxhound, so let's just call it there. So anyways, Raiden is basically playing through a simulation of Metal Gear Solid 1, but there's one issue. The real Solid Snake is there too, to break the fourth wall of the simulation in a way that the GW AI seemingly didn't account for. This would be like if you were playing through MGS1 and Solid Snake suddenly walked into your living room. It would take you out of the experience and immediately force you to acknowledge that you haven't been controlling the real Solid Snake, you're just trying to be like him. Now, before we realize all of this, it appears that Dead Cell is taking the president hostage in an oil spill cleanup facility called Big Shell, and demanding one million dollars or else they'll fire a nuke using the president's biometric data as a key. Raiden sent in to handle the situation with his support team consisting of the colonel and his girlfriend Rose. It turns out that both of these are just the GW AI talking to Raiden, but that's all that needs to be said about that for now. Eventually, Raiden meets up with Solid Snake, who, with the help of Otacon, rescues Emma Emmerich, Otacon's adoptive sister, so that she can use a computer virus she created, which is based on the biological virus Fox Die, to cause a malfunction in the GW AI, ending Raiden's simulation and putting a stop to the Selection for Societal Sanity Plan, S3. Okay, Jesus, now do you see why I said we all needed to be on the same page? This is, without a doubt, one of the most complicated plots I've ever seen in any work of fiction, and we've really only covered the bare minimum needed to dig a bit deeper into this game. Point is, MGS1 was a game that was incredibly similar to its predecessor, but whose message was ultimately about letting go of the past and moving on to do greater things. And MGS2 is a game about a whole bunch of people literally getting together to create a simulation of MGS1 for the sake of preserving history for the future. The biggest difference is that in MGS1, everybody's trying to stay true to their past by learning about their genes. And in MGS2, everybody's trying to stay true to their past by learning about their ideas, their memes. So, we probably all already know what a meme is in social sciences, but I just cannot talk about this series without explaining the definition of a meme at some point. Basically, before a meme was defined as a running internet joke, a meme was defined as an idea that spreads through culture and survives based on its suitability, like a gene, but it evolves through unnatural selection, as humans decide which memes they'll pass on to other people. Music is a meme, road laws are a meme, fire is a meme, and Solid Snake's legacy is a meme. All of us are defined by the memes we've adopted, and Solid Snake is no exception. More so than him sharing Big Boss's genetic code, it was the memes that Snake adopted over his life that led to him being such a perfect soldier, and GW was essentially trying to force those same memes onto Raiden, the S3 plan. Ironically, this is more or less the lesson that Snake teaches Raiden at the end of MGS2, after they've corrupted the GW AI and stopped the S3 plan. In trying to become like Solid Snake, Raiden almost lost himself. And so at the end of the game, Snake tells Raiden that he needs to find his own ideas to pass on to the future. Humans, like Raiden, are more complicated than rats, or fittingly snakes. They don't just exist to inherit genes and pass them on again, and they don't exist to inherit memes and pass them on again. Humans are special specifically because we can create our own memes, our own ideas, based on our own experiences. 
While GW seems benevolent and like it has humanity's best interests in mind, this is what the S3 plan would rob us of. It would rob us of our ability to find our own meaning in the world, and it would rob us of the ability to pass on our own perspectives onto the next generation. Even if those perspectives are biased and filled with half-truths, they are what make us human. And staying human is exactly what Snake and Raiden were fighting for over the course of MGS2. Wow, this really sounds like a conclusion, but that's more or less the stuff that any respectable analysis of MGS2 needs to include. We're going to go a lot deeper. I'll get to how this relates to the series-spanning character arc of Kojima making MGS games while his desire to move on to something else slowly grows more violent and destructive. But first, while we're still on MGS2, we need to talk about what might be my favorite artistic concept in any work. The thing that, to me at least, MGS2 is truly about. So this is the part of the video where I talk about myself for a bit. Basically, while this applies to some of my videos more than others, the point of my channel is to kind of just talk about myself through the lens of games that I relate to and topics that I care about. In my old video on the pros and cons of hitchhiking by Roger Waters, for instance, I compared myself to the album's main character. He struggled with dreams of wild affairs as he entered his later ages and wished he could go back to the carefree life of a 20-something, and I was talking about how often I fantasized about deleting this channel, running off into the woods, and going back to my old drug-fueled lifestyle. That's why the woman playing my estranged wife was wearing the pig mask in that video. That mask is kind of like the face of my channel, and I'd been fantasizing about cheating on her. That's what this channel really is, beneath all the videos that don't quite fit that description. My takes are subjective. I don't want them to be correct. I want them to be correct to me. That's how you make videos that nobody else can make. You speak for yourself, and you find your own things to pass on. Well, way back in the first year of my channel, I didn't really see it that way. Frankly, I was still in the process of working a few self-destructive years out of my bloodstream, and I hadn't put much thought into it. Eventually, however, I made my original video on Metal Gear Solid 2, and that's when I went from being a generic ending explained what you missed channel to being leadhead. In fact, I can pinpoint the exact second in that video that that happened. Metal Gear Solid 2 is incredibly important to me, and as a result, I'm going to talk about myself in this outro more than I typically do on this channel. Voices aside, that probably sounds weird considering how candidly I'm speaking about myself right now, and have been since then, but back in the day that really was uncomfortable for me. I went on to talk about how, even when people were critical of my videos and the takes within, they were still true to me, and that that was a fact that didn't even require faith. So what motivated me to get so personal way back then, when it was so out of character for me at the time? Well, that idea, that my perception of reality is just as valid and valuable as any other perception that claims to be definitive is. It's kind of what MGS2 is all about to me. I know you didn't have much in terms of choices this time, but everything you felt, thought about during this mission is yours, and what you decide to do with them is your choice. You can find your own name, and your own future. See, the most prominent thing in all of Metal Gear Solid 2 is plot twists, specifically centered around challenging what you think you've already seen. We see Snake die in the tanker section, but he's right here, telling us that he isn't Solid Snake, but Iroquois Pliskin. Ocelot is told that S3 stands for Solid Snake Simulation, but it actually stands for Selection for Societal Sanity. Fortune thinks she's an incredible psychic, unable to die, but it's actually just cutting-edge technology, but then she actually is a psychic. We, the audience, were shown outright lies in the marketing material, and all of the game's marketing totally hid Raiden from us and didn't tell us that we'd be playing as him for the majority of the game. Raiden hides his backstory from the player and all the side characters up until the final hour of the game. Solidus claims that he's Solid Snake, Stillman lies about his missing leg, Vamp makes us think not once but twice that Raiden has killed him. Then you've got that especially chilling moment that I showcased in the beginning of this video, when GW actually repeats something in EE's voice, which she never actually said before her death. I could go on and on, but you get it. Now, the very first thing that we hear is Raiden is an outright contradiction to what we saw moments earlier playing a snake. Snake, do you remember the sinking of that tanker two years ago? Of course. Terrorists blow a hole in an oil tanker full of crude barely 20 miles off the shore of Manhattan. All of these lies that prompt you to question what you saw with your own eyes exist to set up that idea that what matters more than anything that the game tells you is how you feel. 
I mean, hell, the solid snake that we see has absolutely no reservations about killing people by the dozens. But I'm pretty sure most of us tried to kill as few people as possible in Metal Gear Solid 1, and the previous two games for that matter. So what, just because some sequel tells us that Snake is cool with killing tons of people, is that supposed to just invalidate our own experiences and the earlier entries to the series? <laughs> Hell no. Kojima's Snake doesn't have to be our Snake. We're told that Meryl survived Shadow Moses, but what if in our playthrough of MGS1, we let Meryl die? That experience is ours, and no stupid sequel can take that away from us. In this way, MGS2 is itself a representation of the S3 plan. It's trying to say, no, forget your experiences and memories of MGS1. This is how it actually went down. Snake's monologue at the end about finding your own things to pass on, it's him telling us to rebel against Kojima's version of Metal Gear and to enjoy our own version of Metal Gear. That's why we're never told if Snake and Otacon were able to rescue Olga's child past the game's events. It's up to us to decide if we think they were able to. It's up to us to imagine who the Twelve Patriots were, and whether or not the S3 plan was able to be pushed on all of society even after Fox Die corrupted GW. The game is prompting us to headcanon our own ending. So, what does all of this have to do with my channel? Well, there's a reason that my MGS2 video is the first time I spoke so openly about my personal feelings, which didn't impact the development of the game at all. Metal Gear Solid 2 is what motivated me to make my channel into what it is. In the months I was working on that script, I won't even say it told me, no, it genuinely taught me that I don't need to seek an absolute correct analysis in my videos. These are subjective analyses. They come from my perspective, and there's a piece of me in every video, whether I intend for it to be there or not. MGS2 taught me to lean into that and make my videos wholly my own. This isn't exactly good marketing for my channel, but in my eyes, these videos are just as much about me as they are the materials I cover. If you've somehow managed to watch and internalize every single one of my videos, then you know me better than anyone I know in real life. Metal Gear Solid 2 is about finding your own meaning and the things you see and passing that meaning onto the world around you. That's why we aren't told the answers to so many important questions about the ending. Imagining your own answers will always be more meaningful and personal and even introspective than having some author tell us what happened. And imagining my own answers is exactly what I aim to do in every video and indeed my whole life. This, if you ask me, all came as a response to the amount of variety there was to people's different experiences in Metal Gear Solid. Every player had their own snake. Some snakes were murderous, some were merciful, some were cautious, some were reckless, some preferred the cigarettes over the thermal goggles to get past lasers, some let Meryl die, some managed to save her. Everybody had their own snake, only now it was time to make a sequel, and so Kojima was forced to a certain degree to decide on how Snake actually got through Shadow Moses. In that way, I kind of think of all of Metal Gear Solid 2 as a rebellion against the very concept of a sequel. I mean, it starts out as what was probably the ideal sequel for 99% of the fanbase. Snake is being an absolute badass, uncovering some big conspiracy, using all of his skills to his advantage, getting caught up in awesome action scenes, getting quippy with Ocelot about the old Kodak team from the first game. It's exactly what MGS fans probably pictured when they imagined Metal Gear Solid 2. Then, however, Snake dies, and we take control of this protagonist that's honestly pretty hard to like at first. I think Raiden's the most compelling character in the entire series, but, well, he's no Snake. His quips constantly fall flat, he's constantly second-guessing himself and mindlessly following orders. We're led to believe that he's never had any actual field experience. He's getting completely whipped by his girlfriend throughout the game, rather than being the sly, flirtatious archetype we expect from his role. Hell, President Johnson even assumes that he's a girl, plus he literally gets pissed on at one point. Really, it can all be summed up by this scene. Even beyond the character himself, his introduction is literally made to disappoint players. We have to put up with what feels like hours of needless codec calls explaining mechanics that we already learned how to use a snake. I mean, look at this bit. You get a codec call and don't answer because you've already been waiting half an hour for the gameplay to start again. And then after you crawl forward another inch, you get a codec call that you have to answer. Of course, this slows down later in the game, but for the first hour or so, depending on how new you are, you're just being assaulted with practically useless codec calls where your support team just talks down to you, explaining game mechanics that you've already learned and used thoroughly by this point in the game. The support team backs off for most of the game after this, but by the end, they are straight up bullying the player. Honestly though, you have played the game for a long time. Don't you have anything else to do with your time? 
This leads to some of the most chilling moments in any game, but it also leads to that long arc that's going to continue to string these games together more than any literal narrative possibly could. In a way that's a good bit simpler than what I was talking about earlier, I think MGS2 is also just Kojima showing us that sequels are messy, and for artistic games like Metal Gear Solid, tend to be just as reductive as they are additive. Again, being told that Snake is XXX and did XXX kind of invalidates the freedom that MGS1 gave players to decide on their own tactics. I used the Nikita missile to take down Sniper Wolf, and that's just as valid as whatever Snake canonically did. Hell, at least in the version I played, they even have a little book in the main menu that tells us exactly what happened in that game, just so we don't feel the need to go back and replay it in some messy way that might not line up with Kojima's canon. This is why there's so much emphasis on the idea of the legend of Solid Snake and how it couldn't possibly compare with the real thing. When you look at MGS2 through the most broad lens possible, it's a game that's desperately trying to be like MGS1, and is all about how being like MGS1 won't accomplish anything whatsoever. Just like how MGS1 was trying to be like Metal Gear 2 and was all about moving on from your past and not letting your history define you. However, while the first game feels like a fun way to cap off the series with a hopeful message about the future of an artist's work, Metal Gear Solid 2 feels like a game that wishes it didn't have to exist, and wants to undermine itself intentionally. It feels like a repeat of the message of MGS1, but this time, rather than using genetic history as a metaphor, the game is specifically talking about the nature of art, human thought, and creativity, and the series itself. So, believe it or not, that was all just the introduction. In the original version of this script that I wrote a couple years ago, I just said that there wasn't much need to go into more detail about MGS2, and I ended it there, pointing the viewers back to my original video from back in the day. After all, MGS2 was originally just a single part of a video about five games. However, I don't know that I'll ever let myself get in-depth about MGS2 on this channel again, so this is the part where I do a full analysis of MGS2. If you want to just get to the end and see my conclusions about the entire series, you can go ahead and skip to MGS3. But to everyone else, buckle up, because this is going to be a wild ride. So let's start with the single most contentious and important part of MGS2, Raiden. More specifically, let's talk about how the relationship between Raiden and the player controlling him develops over the course of the game. I've already established in pretty specific detail just how unlikable this guy is in the beginning of the game. He isn't sly or clever, he's just mindlessly following orders and sticking to the script while he gets treated like a child by a support team. His girlfriend's attitude leads us to believe that he's a really shitty boyfriend, totally emotionally unavailable, like he's just lived his whole life on autopilot and has passion for nothing. So right off the bat, we don't like this guy and we're annoyed that we have to play as him. A couple minutes later though, we have our first straight up argument with Raiden. We as players know what Solid Snake looks and sounds like, but Raiden just does not understand that the person we're talking to is Snake. He tries to question what's going on, only for a support team to immediately shut him down time and time again, so we the players are forced to just play the role of somebody who knows way less about the story than we do. I can't think of a single other game that does something like that. Dramatic irony is usually reserved for non-interactive media. Anyways, moving forward, we get to this bomb defusal section. See, around this point in MGS1, Snake was planting C4s in the basement of the storage building so that he could blow up certain walls and rescue the president of Armstech. But in MGS2, we're doing the exact opposite. We're the ones trying to figure out where another character, who has much more agency in the story than we do, planted his bombs. Metaphorically speaking, we're cleaning up after Snake's mess, the mess he made in MGS1, much like how we had to literally clean up Snake's mess in the beginning of the game on our way to the elevator. Long story short, playing as Raiden is lame as hell, even if the gameplay itself is super fun. This is where we get to the part of my MGS2 talk that so many people have trouble with every time I ramble about this game. See, in MGS1, first person mode exists purely to help the player see what's going on. Outside of sniping and using the stinger missiles, which are completely context dependent items that are totally useless in the vast majority of the game, everything Snake does is done in third person. In and of itself, this wouldn't be anything worth discussing, but let's talk about how the player's relationship with Raiden changes when you make first person mode an integral part of the gameplay. Suddenly, we're not supposed to trust Raiden to auto-aim anymore. We aren't supposed to cleverly evade cameras and guards in third person mode nearly as much as we're expected to just 
hop into Raiden's head and shoot everything ourselves. We're taking more direct control from Raiden and dissociating ourselves from him as a character. In first person mode, Raiden can't do a single thing that makes him special. Whereas in third person mode, he can do a somersault that allows him to clear gaps that Snake can't clear with his dive. Hell, we can't even see his body in first person mode. Using first person mode is like us just telling Raiden, shut up, you can't be trusted to get me the headshots I need with your auto aim. Just stand still and let me handle the guards. I know that this is a pretty bold claim. Being able to go into first person to shoot more precisely was such an obvious innovation for Metal Gear to make. Saying that there's so much artistic intent behind something that's so clearly just designed to make the game more user friendly and fun sounds insane even to me, but this interpretation makes a whole lot of sense once you look at how and when the game forces you to use first person mode throughout its campaign. At least it does to me. So, for the sake of making this a bit simpler, I'd appreciate it if, for the time being, you just accept that when you're doing something in third person, it's Raiden getting to handle it, and when you're doing something in first person, it's the player doing it for Raiden. If you'll grant me that, we can get back to the bombs. So, each of the rooms where we have to handle bombs are designed around Raiden getting to do a whole lot of super fun third person stealth stuff, sneaking around, evading line of sight, just classic Metal Gear stuff only to be hard interrupted by the bombs, where you have to go into first person and look all around the room until you see them, and then standing still and going into first person to use the freeze spray. It's like Raiden gets to have his fun for a minute or two, only for us to keep grabbing his ear and telling him to sit back down in his chair. All the while, we constantly hear about how Snake has defused way more bombs than us in Shell 2, and he's doing so much better. Ultimately though, when we defuse the last bomb, Snake says something like, you're way ahead of me, kid. I've still got one more bomb to handle. That is literally the first time somebody compliments Raiden in the entire game, or even implies that he might be doing a good job at anything. It's a little ego boost, a message from the Patriots that Raiden can accomplish some pretty impressive feats if he just lets somebody else take control for him for a bit. If he drops a bit of agency and just trusts the people controlling him to handle things, he gets shit done. After we get finished with all of these bombs though, Raiden is probably feeling a little bit cocky about a job well done, and so he actively rebels against the player for the first time. We get the fortune boss fight, which is ultimately entirely dependent on Raiden's third person abilities. In fact, going first person here does absolutely nothing but hinder you and put you in danger. In fact, playing this on higher difficulties usually devolves into you just doing Raiden's unique somersault move over and over again to dodge fortune's attacks. That isn't Raiden rebelling against the player, though, that's just a bit of foreshadowing. See, it's practically a meme in the Metal Gear community that people who just don't understand these games are constantly shouting, come on, why doesn't Snake just shoot him at their screens during the cutscenes, when characters are facing each other down and talking about their motivations and backstories. I think it's safe to say that most Metal Gear fans would get pissed off or at least annoyed at Raiden when he just opens fire on Fortune right in the middle of a big character scene between her and Vamp. Ultimately, he's taking away the satisfaction of killing Vamp from the player, and we're left without any glorious one-liners or badass explosions, just a woman crying and Raiden awkwardly shuffling out of the room like he just walked in on his parents having sex or something. Well, as punishment for Raiden's little rebellion, the Patriots force Raiden and the player to work together in the next section where we fight the Mad Bomber, Fat Man. Raiden has to run around this arena using his auto-aim to knock Fat Man down, only for the player to then go into first person to deliver the headshot. We have to dodge Fat Man's attacks in third person and use first person to freeze its bombs, ultimately culminating in us having to do something that Raiden can only do in third person, dragging Fat Man's body to reveal the final bomb. By beating Fat Man, Raiden and the player have proven to the Patriots that they're able to work together, and so the simulation continues. As a matter of fact, later on in the game, we learned that the Fat Man boss fight was the first true test of Raiden's grooming over the course of the game's mission. Had he failed, and Big Shell blew up, the experiment would have ended then. Now, however, we get a lot of third-person actions. We're starting to like Raiden a little bit more now, because he's starting to pick up on the fact that his support team is hiding stuff from him. He's getting to be a bit more of that badass character that we expect to be playing as in Metal Gear games. Because of this, in the next section of gameplay, we get to disguise ourselves as the enemy and have a ton of fun with the unsuspecting guards in third person mode. We're even offered a stash of playboys to facilitate this third person fun. We also have to drag a guard around in CQB, another move that simply can't be done in first person. It's awesome, we're doing classic Metal Gear stuff again. 
We even get to use the directional mic a bit to sniff out Ames' pacemaker just so that the player doesn't feel totally left out of the action during this mainly third person section. Point is, this section where we're barely incentivized to use first person feels more like we're back in MGS1 controlling Solid Snake again than anything else in the game has up to this point. That's why it works out so conveniently that Raiden is wearing a mask during this section, pretending to be someone else. It's the perfect little ribbon to tie around this metaphor. Let's talk a little bit about this simulation, as there's a lot of people online who still don't really understand what's happening here. A lot of people think that the game's events are literally a computer simulation. So basically, the entire Big Shell incident was designed to mimic Shadow Moses, with the objective of turning Raiden into a complete opposite type of man, Solid Snake, through suggestion and conditioning. Every single person we see in the game has been manipulated in one way or the other by the Patriots to play out their role exactly as planned. Whether it's by kidnapping Olga's child to make her play the role of Grey Fox, shutting off Ames' pacemaker so that his death mimics that of Decoy Octopus, or manipulating Solid as Snake into playing out Liquid's role from MGS1, the game hints at this idea that every single thing anyone says or does in this whole game was all a result of the Patriots manipulating people from behind the scenes. Even at the end, it's revealed that the Patriots were one of Snake and Otacon's biggest financial backers. The other thing that people tend to really get confused about is the Arsenal Gear section. The geometry makes zero sense, computer code is basically leaking from the walls, fake game over screens appear, and the colonel tells us to shut off the game console amidst a bunch of briefing for VR missions from the previous games. Clearly this section was made to tell us that none of this is actually happening and we're inside of a computer simulation, right? Well. No, at least I don't think so. See, Otacon explains right around here that the kernel AI wasn't exactly created by the Patriots. Instead, he was created inside of Raiden's own head based on his own expectations for who his commanding officer is supposed to be on this sort of mission. Raiden's nanomachines have intercepted his thoughts and ideas, and the Patriots have used those thoughts to create a version of the kernel that Raiden would think seems totally real. Long story short, what Raiden sees is actually an illusion created by the Patriots. It's why you can diegetically turn off blood by accessing terminals in Big Shell. Raiden isn't affecting the world he's in by turning off blood, he's affecting his own perception of the world by telling his nanomachines to repress images of blood. Here, during Arsenal Gear, Emma's virus is infecting the GW AI that all of this stems from, and so Raiden's memories of VR training are manifesting more vividly in his perceptions. The Colonel starts talking like he did in the Metal Gear Solid 1 VR missions. He gets a sword, just like he had when he was playing through the Grey Fox missions in MGS VR, and eventually he finds himself magically appearing on the photo mode map to fight 25 Metal Gears. Basically, he isn't in a computer simulation, but his visual cortex is being fed a whole bunch of buggy data by the nanomachines, and so he's hallucinating a computerized world. That, in my opinion, is what's literally happening here. I'll get to why the colonel tells you to turn off the game console in a bit, but for now let's get back to the first person versus third person discussion. The player just got to have a ton of fun with Raiden, seeing all sorts of fun things he can do in third person mode, messing around with Raiden's enemy disguises. Ultimately though, after all this fun, I think it's safe to assume that Raiden and the player have started to kind of like each other a bit and trust each other more. Hell, you might even start liking him as a character by this point, as he gets much more confrontational with his support team and starts questioning his orders that little bit more. He's becoming more and more like Snake, like what we want him to be. Well, moving ahead, we get to the Harrier fight, the most direct reference to an MGS1 encounter in this entire game. Our only weapon is one that can exclusively be used in first person, and our third person positioning and dodging is absolutely everything. Raiden and the player are finally working together with some mutual respect for one another. The Patriots' grooming has worked, basically. Raiden's totally fine with standing still for a moment and just trusting someone else to control him. However, from the player's perspective, we had so much fun running around in third person with our disguise that we don't necessarily want to just completely erase Raiden's personality from our experience with him by playing in first person. This is all paid off with Raiden finally learning that Pliskin is in fact Solid Snake, putting him on the same page as us. Now, Raiden's going to be questioning every order he's given, which just makes him more and more likable, seeing as the plot of this game is making less and less sense with every cutscene, and we have questions too. Interestingly though, as Raiden learns some information that we already knew, Solid Snake's identity, he also learns something that he keeps from us, a secret between the player and the player character. 
I'll get to that in a bit though. Point is, we're starting to like Raiden as a character by this point. So to kick off the next section of gameplay after destroying the Harrier, we get to see Raiden do something that Solid Snake straight up cannot do. You're able to jump across this gap using Raiden's somersault, and again, Snake's roll move just straight up can't clear gaps like this. It's almost like Raiden saying, hey, good job using first person to take down that Harrier. Check out what I can do in first person mode. Hopefully by now you're at least invested in hearing where I'm going with all of this first person, third person talk, even if you're not quite on board with this take quite yet. We'll wrap up all of that stuff and move on to some other stuff soon, but first let's take a little break and talk about Rose for a minute. Have you ever been in or seen the type of relationship where one person is trying so hard to be a perfect partner that the other person just quits caring about improving themselves? Like, oh, if my wife cooks me dinner and gives me head every night, I must be doing just fine, no need to improve myself. Or maybe you've encountered the type of relationship where one person is so awestruck by how perfect the other one is that they'll always feel inadequate because they couldn't possibly be as thoughtful or caring as their counterpart. Well, when Rose was being essentially created by the Patriots, she was designed to be both of those things for Raiden. Mind you, Rose is quite literally a government psyop. Raiden's love life is a psyop, and that's an indisputable fact of the story. Rose essentially exists to keep Raiden perpetually in the balance of those two states I mentioned earlier, happy and well laid enough to not question anything or work on improving himself, but coddled and talked down to enough to perpetually feel like he isn't someone who deserves his own agency, like he can't be trusted with anything and he isn't worth anything. He's just gonna go on autopilot and ride the Rose high for as long as he can because he's been manipulated into this docile state of indecision. This was all done to make him as susceptible as possible to the Patriots' suggestion. He's been groomed by them to be as susceptible to other people's ideas as possible, to the point where, in the beginning of the game, he's able to straight up ignore the facts around him in order to mindlessly believe what his support team is telling him. Well, this balance between ego-boosting Raiden and breaking him down to keep him docile but captivated is represented in the gameplay too, and extremely clearly at that. It's why I've been using terminology like punishment to describe certain gameplay sections. They aren't punishing us, the game is insanely fun. They're punishing Raiden for thinking he has a say in how this story goes. Well, the next section is the most obvious example of a punishment towards Raiden in the whole game. Raiden has to sneak through this really unforgiving segment where first person can't help him at all, his own clumsiness almost gets him killed, and metaphorically speaking, the Patriots send out a guard to take a piss on him, which Let's be real, where it's probably partly designed to let the player force Raiden to just sit there and take it for a minute for a laugh. Then the Patriots make the President grab Raiden's balls and explain that he thought he was a woman before sending an ocelot to kill the President so that Raiden would fail his objective. Then we're forced into this extremely grueling and tedious section where we have to swim through this annoying hallway in first person all to get to an extremely difficult boss fight where both first and third person mode have extreme weaknesses and neither one really feels like a great option for handling things. Then we're forced to watch Raiden try and be smooth when he's dealing with his two biggest weaknesses, women and confronting trauma. Then, as if to rub salt on the wounds, we're forced to slowly, tediously guide him by the hand through these sections that would be way more fun if we didn't have to worry about her. Then we get to do the annoying sniping section where every time Raiden runs out of ammo he has to go in third person and pick up more, resetting his aim and making things more difficult for the player every time we have to see his stupid face and his stupid body. <sighs> Previous sections like the Fat Man boss fight were designed as punishments for Raiden. Oh, you rebelled and tried to shoot a boss during your monologue? Well, as punishment we're going to force you to do a boss fight with a ton of first person mode engagements. Now, everything from the sneaking section up to the end of the sniping section, in my mind, is designed as a punishment for both of us, the player and Raiden. It's one grueling, tedious gameplay section after the other, with hardly any fun to be had if I'm being completely honest. This whole section, in my mind, is the Patriot saying, hey, you and the player are starting to like each other a bit more than we intended. We're gonna force both of you to do this really awful stuff until you two hate each other again and just mindlessly follow your orders without any enthusiasm or passion, just like you were doing a couple hours ago. Ultimately, after all of this, the player is pretty much completely left Raiden. We get a fast-paced sneaking section where going into first person just slows us down in our race against the clock, then we get to the Arsenal gear section. Raiden's tortured and reveals that he was actually a child soldier and Solidus was a commander. 
And a plot twist that, again, I've never seen any other game do, it turns out that Raiden knew way more about the plot of this game than we did, and he was just keeping secrets from the player, from his master. We trust him that little bit less when we learn this. That would be the secret that I was talking about earlier on the bridge when he learned about Solid Snake and realized something that we ourselves hadn't realized yet. Next up, we're naked, meaning we can't use hanging mode, we can't use our weapons, we can't do any of the things that we'd learned how to do with Raiden over the course of this game. Essentially, we're just playing 2D Metal Gear again with how restricted our moveset is. And of course, there's absolutely no reason to be using first person mode. At this point, our connection to Raiden is getting looser and looser, and this all comes to a head when Snake gives Raiden a sword. Now Raiden has to do something that is totally different from anything we've ever seen Snake do. Even the control scheme is totally different to any other weapon in Metal Gear, as we have to flick the right stick around to use Raiden's sword. So to fill you guys in on where the plot is at this point in the game, right around here a few minutes earlier, Emma uploaded a virus to GW, which is why the support team starts talking total nonsense to Raiden, and why Raiden's nanomachines are making him hallucinate impossible geometry and visuals. In a literal sense, the simulation is breaking down, and in a metaphorical sense, this is why Snake was able to give Raiden the sword, and so thoroughly break him away from the Patriot's plan to groom him into being another solid snake. It's why playing Metal Gear does not feel like any other Metal Gear game when you're at this section. This would be the perfect place to talk about the Colonel telling you to turn the game console off and goading you into putting the game down because you've been playing for too long. Believe it or not, this is going to come up again at the end of this series when we talk about MGSV. So if you guys watched my video on Kojima's horror experiment, PT, you might remember this part where a Swedish voice breaks in and tells us to not fall for the brainwashing that we're currently being subjected to, then the game crashes. I talked about how the loading screen icon was the insignia of the Order, basically the cult of Silent Hill. Canonically, they were brainwashing young men into killing their families, and the game crashing is when we might realize that PT itself is a program designed by the Order, in a metaphorical sense, to brainwash you, the player, into killing your family. Of course, the game doesn't literally brainwash you, but it's the subtextual idea that it's trying to brainwash you that makes it so unnerving to play. So when the Swedish voice breaks through and tells you to snap out of it, the game crashes because clearly something has gone horribly wrong with the brainwashing if this person telling you it was fake was able to break through. The fox die virus corrupting GW here at the ending of MGS2 basically serves the same narrative purpose as the Swedish voice towards the end of PT. The Patriots brainwashing experiment, Big Shell, is starting to fail, and so they tell you to just close out the game. It's the same concept. MGS2 tried to brainwash us a bit more literally than PT did, but canonically, the brainwashing is failing at this point, so the Patriots tell us to shut off the game as soon as possible so that their hard work doesn't unravel. It's really, really creepy, thinking that these video game gods who have been manipulating every character from behind the scenes might be trying to manipulate the person holding the controller, too. So, the Patriots' plan is failing, and it's time for them to whip out the big guns. The contingency plans for their contingency plans. Their last-ditch effort to shape Raiden into being exactly what they want him to be. They slap him down on top of Arsenal gear and make him fight 20 Metal Gear Rays, depending on the difficulty. It's a fight that plays out exactly like Snake's original fight with Metal Gear Rex in MGS1. You dodge around in first person and wait for the perfect moment to strike in first person with the Stinger missiles. Only this time, we have to do it way more times than we can realistically count during gameplay until Raiden literally just gives up. We get tortured and have to deal with what may very well be the hardest button mashing sequence in any game, especially on the original PS2 release. This section is designed to wear us way, way out, both physically and mentally, and brainwash us into feeling like Solid Snake, even though the cat's already out of the bag on that once ever since Raiden got his sword. I talked about this in another video recently, but the game, that is to say, the Patriots, are wearing us down mentally so that we'll be susceptible to their bullshit. This is when they drop all their pretense and start dumping their philosophy on us. It's 2am, we're tired, we just dealt with an absolutely mind-numbingly difficult boss fight and an even more difficult button mashing sequence. We're perfectly susceptible to everything that the Patriots have to say. This would also be when they decide to rewrite history a bit by putting words in Emma's mouth like I mentioned in the beginning of this video. In fact, they do it with the president too. If this is your first time playing this game, at this point in the story, you're definitely way too mentally exhausted to notice that Emma never actually said that. You simply accept what the Patriots' truth as fact, and that was the whole plan all along. 
Ultimately though, Solidus rouses Raiden out of his brainwashing by reminding him of the freedom he felt from his artificial destiny as a Solid Snake doppelganger when he was using his sword. It's, of course, no coincidence that the sword is what breaks Raiden's handcuffs here at the ending. Moving ahead though, Raiden kills Solidus exactly as the Patriots had planned, and in the end it was all totally meaningless. Or was it? See, Raiden thinks that he didn't learn anything over the course of this game. He can hardly keep all these plot threads straight in his head, and neither can the player. He killed the bad guy, but the Patriots made sure to keep him from learning any sort of a lesson from that experience. That's when Snake comes in and snaps us out of that again. Snake tells Raiden that ultimately it doesn't matter if you understood everything that happened. It doesn't even matter if you learned anything from this game. What matters is how you felt about the things you saw and how you choose to remember the experiences that you had with MGS2, which plot twists you want to believe are true. And he says that it's on you to decide what you want to do with those things. I know you didn't have much in terms of choices this time, but everything you felt thought about during this mission is yours, and what you decide to do with them is your choice. Raiden throws away a set of dog tags with the player's name on them, determined to decide for himself what all of this meant to him, and not let anyone else control his mind ever again. In a broader sense, that right there is exactly why the plot of MGS2 was designed to be so confusing, so nonsensical. From the Patriots' perspective, the story was designed to make us docile to the world around us and to make us accept whatever they say as truth. In real life, the game story was designed to show us that it doesn't really matter what happened canonically. It only matters that we had fun, we thought up interesting thoughts, and we had interesting feelings, and then we can decide what to do with them. So that's what I decided to do. Over the course of this video, and really all of my videos, I took all my thoughts and feelings that I've experienced over my time with MGS2 and decided that I wanted to pass those thoughts on to you, just like Solid Snake said at the end of the game. That's how I can decide my own name. That's how I can decide my own future. If Metal Gear Solid 1 is something along the lines of a game creator declaring that he felt he'd done all he needed to do with the series, and Metal Gear Solid 2 is a game creator declaring that he'd rather leave the series in the memories of the audience than start muddying up people's individual interpretations and meanings with a the canon, then Metal Gear Solid 3 is a warning that if this keeps up, things are going to get stale. <laughs> Gene, meme, scene. As far as I can tell, this idea was first introduced in the E3 2004 trailer for Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. Those first two immediately make sense if you've watched the previous sections of this video. MGS1 is about genes, MGS2 is about memes, but MGS3 is about scenes? What does that mean? Well, let's get into it. So, having just replayed MGS3 for this video, I noticed that it feels like it's a lot less about its themes than the previous two games. I mean, MGS1 was all about genes. It had a genetic clone pitted against his twin, fighting a cast of characters who all basically have parental trauma, and the genome army. Metal Gear Solid 2 is about memes, and the manipulation of ideas, and the entire point of basically everything in that game is to mess with your own perception of reality and try to control how you think. MGS3 says it's about scenes, and it is, I'll get into that in a bit, but I find it's more about Naked Snake learning to balance his humanity with his loyalty as a soldier, only to realize that humanity isn't really compatible with what the world needs from him now. Every other game in the series ends with our player character looking forward to their new life. This is the only one that ends with Snake being utterly hopeless. And that's very important for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. So, MGS3 is the first game in the series that feels like it's really about the characters above anything else. With that in mind, let's quickly recap the story, since all of the plot twists and the last half can make things pretty confusing when you look back at it all. Basically, during World War II, the Soviet Union, America, and China formed together to create a branch called the Philosophers, pretty much the Illuminati, the Patriots before the Patriots, and they pulled together a huge sum of money to rebuild the world after World War II. 
This money is hidden all over the world, and the key to finding it was information on a microchip called the Philosopher's Legacy. Vulgan, one of the parties vying for control of Russia, managed to manipulate a few political situations so that he would inherit the legacy, and he used his money to begin development on the first Metal Gear prototypes. The boss, Naked Snake's mentor, after her Cobra unit was disbanded, was put on a mission by America to fake her defection and join up with Vulgan in order to locate the Philosopher's Legacy and return it to America. To help her in this mission was Ocelot, an NSA codebreaker who acted as a triple agent, making everybody think he'd betrayed America to work for Russia, but actually being a spy for the CIA. When the boss fakes her defection to Vulgan's forces, she gives him a Davy Crockett portable nuke launcher, and Vulgan fires it at the now antiquated design bureau that was working on a failed Metal Gear prototype, in order to blame America, since Snake was seen on a mission to rescue a scientist, Sokolov at the time. The nuke going off immediately made Khrushchev suspect America of breaking the conventions of war, and so the boss's mission to locate the Philosopher's Legacy was revised. She would now have to locate the Legacy and deliver it to America with the help of Ocelot, and let herself be killed by Snake, in order to prove that she had indeed defected, to sell Russia on the lie. Snake is supposed to meet up with Adam, aka Ocelot, only his meeting is interrupted by a woman calling herself Eva, the other codebreaker who had supposedly defected. Eva is actually a spy, trained by the Chinese branch of the Philosophers, and ordered to collect the legacy for China. She fools everyone into thinking that she works for America, and ultimately manages to steal a fake Philosopher's legacy, as the real one is actually in Ocelot's hands, along with the development plans for the first Metal Gear. That would be the TX-55 Metal Gear that Solid Snake would go on to destroy in Metal Gear 1 for the MSX. America begins development on Metal Gears, and using the Philosopher's Legacy, they create the Patriots, the same shadow organization that acted as the Illuminati in MGS2 and tried to control information. So to put it all as simply as possible, Snake has to kill Vulgan and the boss in order to stop the Cold War from turning hot, and through a series of crazy spy antics, America is poised to create the Patriots, while Russia and China are left to pick up the scraps. Okay. Told you it was complicated, and I barely even touched on Sokolov or Granin, but whatever, that's plenty for now. Let's talk about the times so that we can start chipping away at the deeper meaning behind this insane spy story. The times. The times. The times. The times. The times. So throughout a lot of the game, any time that someone who was involved with the philosophers is talking, they're talking about something called the times. They're talking about how politics determine who you have to face on the battlefield, and how a change of just a few years is enough to turn friends into enemies. Ultimately, in the boss's eye, accepting this truth is the key to world peace. Once you accept that war is nothing but an arena for politicians, the very concept of a nation becomes almost meaningless. This is a philosophy that makes a whole lot of sense for the boss. After her Cobra unit was disbanded, she was forced to kill her lover and comrade, the Sorrow, all because of a shift in the times, which turned allies into enemies. Now Snake is in the exact same situation, forced to kill the person who, in his own words, owns half of his soul. Somebody who he lived and died with for 10 years. And Snake has to choose whether he'll be loyal to the times or loyal to what he believes in. Snake puts the mission above all else, ditching his own humanity in the process and killing someone that he loves. This attitude of Snake's caring little for his own humanity and focusing instead on devoting himself entirely to the mission makes him weird. He's surrounded by interesting characters who are all quippy and unique and memorable, but Snake himself is cold. While, yes, it's kind of a silly scene, Eva's introduction to Snake is a perfect example of how empty Snake is. She tries to seduce him normally, and he barely responds at all, so she has to seduce him with a gun and information critical to his mission to start earning his trust. Before moving forward, I think we need to touch on one very important line. When the boss is staging her defection to Vulgan, she says that Snake is still too pure, and that he hasn't yet found an emotion to carry into battle. The Cobra unit is composed of the Fury, the Pain, the Sorrow, the End, and the Joy, Boss. Each one of them has a philosophy and an emotion that drives their humanity in spite of their dedication to their missions. Snake, however, is just Snake. He isn't a person, he's a gun, a tool for his government, nothing but a meaningless vessel for both politicians and the player. This is, in my eye, what MGS3 is the most about. Snake learning to carry an emotion into battle so that he can become more than just a gun. As the game progresses, Snake's emptiness shows more and more. He isn't as soulless as, say, Raiden at the beginning of MGS2. He still jokes a little bit, and he has some quips here and there, but 
you get the impression that this man just doesn't feel. Like, all of his joking with paramedic is just a mask he wears. He doesn't even react to Eva's advances whatsoever for most of the game. He just grits his teeth during the torture scenes. He goes forward on his mission, knowing full well that it's going to end with him killing his best friend and lover. This all fits really well with the cold, systems-based gameplay of the Metal Gear series. Once you understand the systems well enough, there's zero ambiguity. You climb trees the exact same way every time. Guards react to sounds the exact same way every time. Snake responds to your controller and puts the exact same way every time, whether his leg is broken or he's starving to death. Snake, and indeed every Metal Gear protagonist, feels like a robot in a way that's just hard to put your finger on. There's just something so mechanical about the way that these characters control, and that's critical to the amazing feeling of the gameplay, but it's something that the games like to play with some. Here in MGS3, that mechanical nature of snakes extends to the survival systems too. Hunger is nothing but a gauge, with very concrete, definable consequences to neglecting it. Injuries are healed cold and sterilely in some menu, and more experienced players will even opt to not heal their injuries at all, as letting them heal naturally gives you a bigger health meter. You can just spin Snake around in the survival viewer to make him vomit up poisons. Both within and without Snake, MGS3 feels like the most mechanically driven game in the entire series. There are just loads and loads of mechanics here, each one operating without any ambiguity. But back to Snake, he feels like the most mechanical Snake we've ever gotten to control. And that fits perfectly with this idea that he's willing to put the mission above his own humanity. It doesn't matter what he feels, all that matters is what buttons you press. However, Snake does have a character arc in this game. He doesn't stay this heartless killing machine from beginning to end. He finds an emotion to carry into battle just in time to take on the boss. I can't say exactly what that sensation is. You could say it's love, or pain, or dedication, or courage. Hell, it could even be fear or rage. It kinda depends on how you play, honestly. Regardless of what emotion he finds for himself, Snake feels way more like a human by the end of this game than he does in the beginning. He's loosening up a bit. He's starting to allow himself to have fun and connect with people. It's actually a little bit beautiful watching him slowly let Eva into his heart, even as he knows that she's an agent on a mission of her own. However, Snake still has to complete his mission. In the final hour of this game, Snake learns from the boss that she really is still working with America, and that her sacrifice was essentially nothing but a way for America to get its hands on the Philosopher's Legacy. He and the boss gave everything just to get some money for a few people who saw them as disposable all along. He learns that the Philosophers intentionally caused these shifts in the times that turned people like the boss into enemies, partly as a way to fuel the military-industrial complex, but also as a way of maintaining an unstable political situation in the world, so that it's easier for them to maintain power. However, the Philosophers themselves fell victim to these changes in the times, and were split apart, like Snake and the boss. Snake, at the end of MGS3, figures out how to balance being human with being a soldier, just in time to learn that this new generation he's moving into doesn't want him to be human. They just want him to be a gun. Mind you, we already know by the end of the game what this is all leading to. The world of Metal Gear Solid 2, where thoughts are being manipulated, war is controlled, and where passion and individuality are left to die. This world doesn't want the sorrow, the pain, the joy, the fury, or the fear. The world doesn't need Jack, the soldier who learned empathy. The world wants a soldier who can be soulless, a puppet for politicians, and for the player. The world doesn't want Jack, it wants Snake. Now, with a normal leadhead analysis, this would basically be the end of it. I've analyzed what happens in the game and what it means to me, but again, you can't spell Metal Gear without meta. MGS2 was all meta all the time, but the meta narrative that I see in MGS3 is something that lays beneath all of this other stuff. See, this is a really dense game, richly packed with interesting character arcs, emotional moments, excitement, and intrigue, but beneath all of that stuff is something like a cry for help from Kojima and the Metal Gear series as a whole. Again, I don't want to put words in Kojima's mouth, but this is all that I see when I think about this game. So let's go back and take a broader look at what Metal Gear Solid 3 really is, the way that Konami probably saw it when it was pitched. It's more Metal Gear, but this time it's set in the 60s and it takes place in the jungle. 
Still though, it's more Metal Gear. Double and triple agents betraying each other, mechanically deep stealth action, boss fights with wacky characters, a guy called Snake killing someone that he owes part of his soul to, a scheme to spark a world war that turns out to actually all be a ploy by the Illuminati, a radio team providing support, each with their own specialty, a constant journey north with a bit of backtracking here and there to get keys that can open new paths, a climactic final act that flips the stealth core on its head to deliver something more bombastic. Every game that I've talked about so far in this series feels like it could just be an alternate universe sequel to Metal Gear 1, and that, in my mind, is why the theme word for this game is obscene. It doesn't matter where or when you set a Metal Gear game, it's always going to be a Metal Gear game with a pretty similar plot. Guys named Snake are always going to kill people that they're close to because that's what the world wants from Metal Gear, and that's what America wants from guys named Snake. From now until the end of this video, every time that you hear me say Snake, I'm referring to the concept of Snake, specifically the ones we control. That means Naked Snake, Raiden, and Solid Snake. We'll get to Venom Snake when the time comes. In the actual timeline of Metal Gear, the things that Naked Snake does in this game lead to the things that happen to Solid Snake and Raiden in MGS2, but in the thematic arc of the series, this game comes last. The abstract concept of Snake, originally learned to love his life, then he learned to live his life without fear, then he learned to pass his message on. Now, it's time for him to learn something else. Ironically, the most bombastic, action-packed game in the series so far, to me, is really just trying to say, hey, if things keep going like this, it's gonna get really stale. Snake learns that his future is going to be one where he never gets to just ride off into the sunset and have his peace. No matter what we do, Snake will only ever exist if he's on a mission to kill someone he's got major history with. Because that's what happens in Metal Gear, and Snake can't exist without Metal Gear. It's a weird concept, I know, but if you ask me, that's what the handshake at the end of Metal Gear Solid 3 is all about. It's Snake acknowledging that he'll only ever exist as a weapon. It's him accepting that his story won't ever have a happy ending. It's him learning that his role as a protagonist isn't to finally become whole as a person and leave the series behind, but to just keep on doing the same thing he was doing in the other games, forever. This is where the fatalism that comes with being a prequel comes into play. The informed Metal Gear player knows from the very beginning that Naked Snake is going to turn into the villain of the series, Big Boss, by the end. We know that whatever Naked Snake goes through in this game, some other guy named Snake is going to be doing something very similar 50 years later, and that society's already doomed in a way. We know from the very beginning that all of this talk about finding yourself and learning to share your humanity with your role as a soldier is just going to lead to the cold, sterile mercenary nations of Metal Gear 1 and 2, and the outright death of free will that we learn about in MGS2. Metal Gear will always be Metal Gear, and Snake and MGS3 finally learns to accept that. So hopefully you get what I'm saying so far. MGS3 is about Snake, this abstract concept that we've been controlling for five games now, learning that no matter what happens, as long as there's another Metal Gear, he won't ever get a happy ending. The game creates this idea by drawing a ton of parallels between itself and the previous Metal Gear games, particularly those first two, the 2D ones on the MSX. Snake starts with an impassable barrier to the south and moves north through ever more heavily guarded jungle and urban environments. He fights bosses with incredibly simple core concepts. Those bosses explode for practically no reason when they die. He fights an enemy who's known for his aim that guards a prison area. He gets a transmitter planted on him after escaping a prison. He has a fist fight with an electricity-themed enemy in a square room before taking on a Metal Gear and rushing to the end of the game in a chase scene where he departs via aircraft and kills somebody who he was super close to. I could go on and on and on. While MGS1 had a ton of callbacks to the original 2D games, MGS3's references to the originals are a lot more literal. It uses almost all of the same ideas and concepts of the original games, but jazzed up with more modern technology, writing, and direction. Thematically, this works on two levels. Firstly, it better ties the games to Metal Gear 1 and 2, the games that come immediately after this one in the timeline at launch and are all about Big Boss, the character that Naked Snake was doomed to turn into. That's why Metal Gear 1 and 2 are playable in most versions of Snake Eater through the main menu. So basically, everything from the mechanical, inhuman precision with which Snake and his enemies move, to the boss's simpler motivations and characters, to the general structure of the game and its sequence of events, 
all exist to drive home this idea that Snake exists solely as a video game character. As somebody who doesn't ever exist unless his god, Hideo Kojima, needs him to go on a heartbreaking mission of loss and emotional ruin, and any personal fulfillment, lessons learned, introspection, or greater understanding of life he attains by the end of a given game won't be enough to save him from being put in some other game some other day. Basically, if a game as outstandingly weird as Metal Gear Solid 2 winds up having so many plot similarities to the rest of the series, then at this point, we all pretty much know exactly what we're getting into when we pick up a brand new Metal Gear game. Snake knows exactly what he's getting into when Kojima allows him to exist again. For most series, this isn't too big of a problem. Master Chief fights aliens and that's all. But for Kojima, a creator who didn't even plan on making Metal Gear 2, much less a Metal Gear Solid 2, it's stale. I can only imagine that by this point in the series, Kojima pretty desperately wanted to move on to a different game, with a different universe and a different tone, different themes and ideas, but he simply wasn't allowed to. The Patriots, I mean uh, Konami, said, we need to break Snake's heart again, we need to deconstruct his masculinity again and make him question everything he knows one more time. This is what Eva and the boss mean when they talk about the times. It's why Kojima's theme word for MGS3 was scene. Because at the end of this game, Snake learns that regardless of the scene, time and place of the game he's in, he's doomed to do the same stuff over and over forever because the times demand it. Without Konami and without Kojima, there are no times. So long as Snake exists, the times are going to make him go on another classic, some might say played out, Metal Gear adventure again. So to sum up where MGS3 sits on that long arc that I keep ending these videos with, MGS3 is, to me, saying, pretty please let me be the end of the series. We've gone full circle all the way to the jungle in the 60s, but the times still control Snake. Just like they've controlled every iteration of Snake, and now there's nowhere for us to go but back around the circle again. Just look at that bandana. If you can't put the past behind you, you won't survive long. There's a dozen reasons why this game is called Snake Eater. My favorite among them is that a classic example of a snake eater is an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. Like an Ouroboros, Metal Gear has become a series that just consumes snakes, chews them up and tosses them out. And this is the game where Snake truly loses any hope for a happy ending. I am really glad to be doing more objective, literal analyses between all of this crazy meta insanity that's been punctuating the rest of this series so far. I don't expect everyone to buy what I'm saying in those sections, since they're essentially just a way more fleshed out version of what's become known as the phantom pain argument, which is basically a joke in the community. People go around saying the Phantom Pain is supposed to be bad because Kojima didn't like Metal Gear anymore, he's trying to sabotage the series. Similarly, oh, Raiden's supposed to be annoying, or oh, the plant section is designed to be really boring, or oh, MGS3 was designed to feel like it doesn't have any new ideas. I think that that argument really sells Kojima short, and sells short how varied and dynamic this series is. While it's no secret that working for Konami is awful, and Kojima has basically envisioned every single Metal Gear game since Metal Gear 1 as being the last in the series, Kojima clearly had gigantic ambitions for these games since the very beginning. I mean, if you ask me, MGS 1, 2, and 3 all have a meta-narrative about moving on from the past and starting a new series, but each one of those games has so much more going on inside of them than just that idea of a creator wanting to be done with the series. While that concept is something that gets more and more pronounced as we move through the series, MGS 4 and V are a whole, a whole lot more than just Kojima trying to kill the series by any means necessary. I myself have puppeted the narrative that that's basically the main point of MGS 4. Frankly, at the time of writing, I think that that's still the most interesting thing in the game, how self-destructive it feels. But there's a whole hell of a lot more that my original MGS 4 video didn't touch on. And as I sit down to replay it, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. 
we're still going to be covering that self-destructive side, as that meta angle is a major part of why I originally wanted this to all be a single video, but there's a whole lot of really great things about MGS4 that I've never really seen anyone talking about. So let's replay this monster of a game. Wish me luck. Oh my god. <laughs> Look, Death Stranding is still my favorite game of all time, and Metal Gear Solid 2 is still my favorite game in the series, but, well, I didn't know that a game could be that good. And my entire job is talking about how amazing games can be. MGS4 went from being my least favorite game in the series to being my second favorite, behind only the game that, as I said a couple of videos back, literally changed my life and helped me define myself. Like I said, I've played this game before, and while I've always respected it, I never exactly liked it. We'll get into why later, but we need to start with what made this playthrough different for me. Having marathoned MGS 1, 2, and 3 in the days beforehand helped me digest the reference-heavy plot, and playing on the extreme difficulty for the first time forced me to really learn the game. But there was something else. Something that fundamentally changed this game to its very core from the other time that I played it. I was house-sitting this weekend, and I had access to the craziest home theater I've ever seen. Sure, the game looked really good on that TV, but what changed everything in this game was surround sound. In my case, Dolby Atmos surround sound. I'd previously only played this game with the speakers of some crappy eBay bot Chinese TV, and I found the gameplay ridiculously hard to digest and enjoy, even on a lower difficulty, whereas the other games in the series were so incredibly mechanically driven and readable, that's just not what MGS4 is. Playing this game with true surround sound provided me with the most immersive experience I've ever had with a game, maybe even beating out Half-Life Alex. I know it sounds weird that I've talked more about the sound setup than the game itself so far, but Surround sound, if you ask me, was so fundamental to my enjoyment of this game. This is a game about sense. That's the theme word for this game. Officially, it goes gene, meme, scene, sense, peace, race. Whereas the previous games would show you more or less exactly how far an enemy could see and give you these handy overhead cameras that gave you all the information you needed to plan and manipulate the situation, this game doesn't give you any of that information. This is a game about using all of your senses to extrapolate data about your situation. You, the player, can't smell or taste enemies, but that's about it. You can hear exactly what's going on, down to the footsteps making different sounds depending on the footwear and the surface being walked on. You can feel an enemy's presence based on the vibration of the controller. For instance, here, I was paying careful attention to the rumble of my controller, as it indicated how close the overhead helicopter was, which would inform my tactics, all without having to take my camera off the ground enemies to stare at the sky. You can get a read on a soldier's state of mind by looking at them. If they were distracted with combat, or running away from a dangerous situation, or if something had caught their attention, their body language will inform you of that, and you can make a decision based on that. These aren't just cool little details that don't matter too much in practice, like similar details were in MGS3. These are the details that make this game playable. Gene, meme, and scene were mainly referring to thematic details of the narrative and meta-narrative in the previous three games, but the theme word sense describes every single aspect of MGS4. Since a lot of people probably want something really meaty to kick off a video like this, let's go ahead and demonstrate how these soldiers' psyches actually work. While, yes, reading body language and using context clues to figure out if a guard is distracted or not is important, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you equip the solid eye and look at these soldiers or any other character in the game, you see these colors to the right of their ID. These correspond to different responses to combat fatigue that each character is predisposed to. So a soldier with a red aura can be sent into an angry frenzy. When pushed to their limit by watching their friends die or having several near-death experiences, they snap into a psychotic rage and rush towards whoever they're fighting without a second thought for their own survival. They even start foaming at the mouth. This is super useful against soldiers that are making themselves difficult to hit, like a sniper. Soldiers with this blue aura will start crying their eyes out when they're pushed to their limit. Tactically, this essentially just takes them out of the fight until they're able to take a breather and calm themselves down. Soldiers with green auras will start violently screaming, distracting nearby soldiers and calling attention to themselves. Lastly, soldiers with yellow auras, when pushed to their limit, snap into a state of psychotic masochism, randomly attacking friend and enemy alike. 
While, yes, you absolutely can use all of this information to your advantage, it isn't always the most useful set of tricks, given that you can just as easily dispatch a soldier by simply shooting them. However, just knowing that all of these effects are being simulated in real time for every single soldier you see adds this absolutely insane sense of depth to the game. It makes each soldier feel like an individual and helps to contextualize all of the trauma that they've experienced that's being suppressed by those nanomachines of theirs. By the way, whenever Ocelot suppresses their nanomachines and all the soldiers start acting like zombies, this is what's actually going on there. All of them are experiencing their combat fatigue, exactly as they would in standard gameplay if you stress them out too much. However, that's just the other characters. Their emotions impact how they perceive the world and how they interact with it. What's equally interesting is how Snake perceives his world, how Snake and the player's senses work in this game. This is the kind of thing that's incredibly hard to do justice in video form, so how about I just give you an example of the moment that this concept of using your senses really clicked for me, and I felt like I was truly getting this game for the first time. It was this section right here. I'd been stuck on this checkpoint for so long. I probably retried 20 times, each attempt taking like 8 or more minutes. I tried everything from freeing the prisoners to make a distraction for myself, to sneaking along the outer perimeter of the base, to diving from rooftop to rooftop, to luring as many guards over here to me so that I could take them out without their friends being able to see them. But eventually I made it through, only to find that I wouldn't hit the next checkpoint until I was able to sneak through the absolute gauntlet over there. The opening act in Afghanistan was definitely easier, since almost every PMC mercenary was distracted with combat, and I could disguise myself as the militia soldiers they were fighting. But I had one major advantage here that I didn't have in Afghanistan. Everything was quiet. The surround sound and perfect playing conditions had immersed me in the previous act with gunshots and mortar fire filling the room from all directions, but it was too much information for me to reasonably process and turn into much useful data about the situation. Here though, I could take all the time I needed to listen to every footstep, hear every bird disturbed by movement, every blade of grass trampled underfoot, and soon enough I had not a good understanding of where every guard was, but a workable understanding. As soon as I slowed down and let myself really just breathe in that air around Snake, I found myself thinking not like I would in MGS3, but in a totally new way that no game, Metal Gear or otherwise, has ever asked me to do. As I went forward, the local militia showed up and they were, by chance, also heading towards my target. Fighting broke out between them and the PMC soldiers I was trying to sneak past, but by then I had the foundation to this new understanding of MGS4. Suddenly I caught myself thinking about my enemy's state of mind. I realized that just because there are bombs and gunshots going off in all directions doesn't mean that I need to start running. I kept things slow, I breathed, and I waited for my opportunities, and next thing I knew I was right there, in the backyard of the mansion that the PMC was defending, and nobody had any idea that I'd gotten there. Soldiers would walk right past me, their eyes strictly focused on the front line of the battlefield. I kept things slow and I did my best to pay attention to every detail, even in this hectic situation, and I managed to get to my objective pretty easily. Every time I failed in this game, got stuck at a checkpoint for half an hour, and went outside to get some air, I would tell myself, just focus, breathe, take things slow, pay attention to every little detail. And that proved to be the thing that made me start enjoying this game, and the surround sound is what made it so natural to do. When I got to Laughing Octopus a little bit later, I aced the fight. I knew roughly where she was all the time, and when she disguised as something in the building, I slowed down to a crawl, listening for her laughter, and caught her time and time again. The last time I played this game, I was stuck on this fight for like an hour, and I wasn't even on the hardest difficulty at the time. This time, though, I let my senses dictate my actions instead of my normal MGS instincts and reflexes, and the fight was a cinch. I'll stop with the play-by-play -play of Act 2 shortly, but what happened next is really important. Raiden called me up and taught me all about tracking so that I could follow the little clues left by Naomi and find where Liquid's PMC had taken her. This tracking section, much like Laughing Octopus, felt like a total slog the first time that I played it, but this time, with this new understanding of the game, it was one of the highlights of my entire playthrough. I watched extremely closely for Naomi's distinct slipshoe footprints as I slowly creeped along in the woods. I paid attention to every little detail, each sound I could hear, from my own footsteps to the birds in the distance. 
every leaf that fell from a tree, every bit of running water which could give me some information on the layout of this place. I was wary of the slight hum of my thermal goggles alerting enemies to my position. I focused on every little clue that the environment gave me, and in doing so, I was able to subvert what felt like a dozen ambushes that had caught me off guard the first time I played. Like I said, this is an extremely hard thing to put into words. The only way that I can really describe it is, again, that I simply let myself breathe the air around Snake, and that's what finally helped me succeed and finally made the game click for me. From this point on, I was in. I don't mean to turn this into a straight up review of MGS4. I'll get to the real thematic significance of this stuff soon, but there's something really, really cool that happens when a game forces you to get this immersed, and it was something that I never experienced before. See, whether it was a quiet forest full of enemies lying in ambush, or a violent, loud, and hectic battlefield, I had all the time in the world to take in every little detail before making my move during the normal sneaking sections of this game. But when things get really intense, suddenly I was getting this incredible sense of sensory overload. The game had trained me to recognize that there isn't a single leaf falling from a tree that falls for no reason. Every detail was vitally important to my success. Then suddenly I found myself having to adapt that mindset to a situation like this one. It's like turning on your night vision goggles at the exact same time that the lights suddenly come on again and you're just blinded. These climactic action sequences felt so damn real as a result of how the game had groomed me to be hyper attentive beforehand. That combined with the sheer difficulty of this game, the hardest in the series in a lot of ways, made for some of the most engaging moments that I've ever had with a game. To give a quick example, I was fighting the final member of the Beauty and the Beast Corps, Screaming Mantis. After a few attempts, I was starting to know most easily how to beat her. She has two dolls, Sorrow, which controls the dead, and Mantis, which controls the living. I made a point of killing as many soldiers as I could, as I focused on stealing her Sorrow doll. Once I had the Sorrow doll, she had no more soldiers to control, as I'd already killed everybody that was alive. She was more or less defenseless now, except for one really dangerous and difficult to dodge attack where she throws four karambit knives at you. I managed to steal her mantis doll too, so that she could no longer use Meryl to bait me out, and she was all mine. I was one hit away from dying, and she was just about to use that incredibly dangerous knife throwing attack. As soon as I saw this, I paused, pulled out the mantis doll, and fired it at Screaming Mantis. To my surprise, the game prompted me to hold the left bumper and shake the controller. A little known fact about the PS3 controller is that every button is pressure sensitive, save for L3 and R3. The system can tell how hard you press square or the bumpers, and it was only by pressing R1 extra hard that you could actually choke a guard unconscious. So knowing this, I pressed L1 about as hard as I've ever pressed a button in my life, and I shook the controller so hard that I almost hurt my arm while grunting something under my breath like, give me control, Mantis. Help. <laughs> In the later half of the button mashing sequence, I literally caught myself saying, you can do it, Snake, between the pained moans of my exertion. <laughs> this kind of sounds lame, like some little brother shit, but this is huge for me. I'm the type to die in Dark Souls one hit away from finishing a super hard boss fight and just give a little and move on. For me to be so engaged with what's going on in a game that I'd not only start talking to the boss, but also remember, even in the heat of the moment, what that doll was even supposed to do in the game's fiction, allow me to control her, is absolutely incredible. This is what all of that immersion is really good for. It's a really unique twist on stealth gameplay, but that newfound immersion straight up transformed the game for me into something that I didn't even know video games were capable of being. Me having to shake the controller like that and squeeze L1 for dear life touches on something that's really interesting about Kojima games for me. He really likes to use the hardware available to its absolute fullest. We all know about Psycho Mantis reading your memory card in MGS1, but knowing that in MGS3, for instance, how hard I press square determines if I choke a guard unconscious or just snap his neck connects you with the game in a way that I've never seen another game maker do. Zooming in on cutscenes with the up button and having the game display in full detail the microscopic shakiness of my finger well, it makes me feel like my body itself is part of the game. Like Kojima might as well have me on a heart rate monitor and had Snake's stress gauge reflect my own finger shakiness. 
When you combine this incredible, and as far as I'm concerned, unmatched use of sound with this intricately detailed gameplay where every individual NPC has their own mental state, the incredible use of controller rumble, and the Metal Gear thing where paying attention to the story can help you in the gameplay, that's really what it feels like. It feels like everything that could possibly exist inside my body, inside my room, and inside my mind has some small impact on the tactics I'm going to use to progress the game and the game state itself. I kind of made a point of trying to focus my whole life on this game for the two days that I had to play it on that amazing setup while I was house sitting. I would take regular breaks, be it to take the dog for a walk or just get some air in between the cutscenes or after really difficult checkpoints, and whenever I stepped away from the game, I made a point of abandoning my usual media addicted ways. I wouldn't look at my cell phone or anything, I'd just try to focus and pick up on as many little details of my environment as possible, just like in the game. I'd catch bugs flying near lights by seeing their shadows. I'd watch the cat's ears as she reacted to every little sound from the nature around her. I'd feel my purse hanging off of me and try to sightlessly identify what parts of it were touching the chair whenever I shifted positions. I'd idly scan the area with my ears, identifying which parts of the yard had the higher concentration of crickets. It's the sort of stuff you do all the time without thinking about it, and when I'd go back inside to play more, I'd realize that I was applying the same senses that I'm passively using in day-to-day -day life to the game in a way that I never had before. Sense. That's the name of the game with MGS4. It permeates through every aspect of how the player interacts with this game, from gameplay to just watching cutscenes. This is where we get to the story. How does MGS4 bring it on home and tie this incredible and, as far as I'm aware, never again attempted focus on the player's senses to its narrative and themes? Well, let's get into it. So first off, this is the most complicated plot in any Metal Gear game, so if Snake Eater gets its own plot recap section, then MGS4 does too. A lot of this is revealed through plot twists, so I'll just tell it exactly how it is, exactly how it's delivered. Okay, so there's a lot to take in here. Just bear with me. Ocelot replaced his arm with liquids after Grey Fox cuts it off in MGS1, and he uses psychotherapy to fool himself into thinking that he's Liquid Snake, thus creating a semi-new character, Liquid Ocelot. He managed to reconstruct the GW AI that Emma's worm cluster destroyed in MGS2, and because of his mind programming, he was somehow able to trick the AI to work for him by using the biometric data of Solidus Snake, who's the only perfect clone of Big Boss, as a password. He tricks the AI cluster that essentially is the Patriots into accepting accepting GW as one of their own. Because of the way that the AI cluster is programmed, GW has second priority as the leader of the cluster, and so if Liquid is able to nuke the satellite that has the JD AI, the current leader of the AI cluster, then GW will move up the list and become the leader of the entire AI cluster, giving Liquid total control of the Patriots and, by proxy, all of mankind. The reason that control of the Patriots means control of the world is because they were currently developing a system to control people's senses through their nanomachines in order to bring perfect order and synchronicity to mankind. Look, I wrote like three pages trying to summarize all of the information that makes this plot make sense, but the more I think about it, the more it seems ridiculous and redundant to even attempt to do so. I promise that this story does make sense, but there's just too much to go over for this type of video, and most of it really wouldn't help me demonstrate my cases here. Let's just go over the facts that are actually relevant to what I have to say about this game's story and the game itself. More than the other videos in this series, this part is really going to benefit from you having played the game. Unfortunately, it's the most difficult game in the series to get working, since buying a PS3 for yourself is pretty much your only option unless you have an insanely powerful computer. For some reason, the AI just straight up broke during the Screaming Mantis fight, so I get to just have these three little goofy gals fucking dancing here for my background shot. This is awesome. What the fuck is this emulator? Anyways, let's get into it. Basically, the Patriots, which for a refresher are the AIs that this game's equivalent to the Illuminati left to rule over the world, have taken complete control over the very concept of a battlefield. Private military companies, PMCs, have all but antiquated the concept of nation-oriented armies. Every PMC is registered into the Patriot system, and every PMC soldier has their feelings manipulated by their nanomachines, by the Patriots. 
So a soldier can literally sense everything that their squad mates sense, and the nanomachines also mess with the user's neurotransmitters and hormones and whatnot to produce what is essentially a never-ending combat high. They suppress fear and anguish and guilt and hesitation, and controlling your senses, they can more or less control you. This is best demonstrated in this scene, where Rat Patrol 01 looks to be completely finished, but their nanomachines communicating with each other helps them to act as a single, autonomous unit. And in the scenes where Liquid temporarily shuts down people's nanomachines. Every time that this happens, years of PTSD, guilt, fear, loss, and anger stop being suppressed and hit the soldiers' psyches all at once, and their minds just can't take the stress. On top of that, save for antiquated weaponry that was never dismantled, like the Mississippi, you can't fire a gun or start the engine of a Humvee without the Patriots' consent. They can lock you out of your equipment whenever they want. All of the violence and grittiness of war has been washed clean. Nobody's fighting for a cause, nobody feels the effects of combat, nobody fears for their lives. It's all just like a video game to them. In a way, it's sort of a really nice extension of that idea at the end of MGS3, how every Metal Gear game is just a signifier of the times that necessitated a Metal Gear game to be made, that is to say, Konami's bank account. These soldiers aren't fighting for a cause either, they're just fighting because their masters told them to, just like Hideo Kojima, or Snake, or anybody else in this series by this point. So, the Patriots have done this to stimulate the war economy. It's this game's term for the military-industrial complex, which societies come to rely on, and as a test. They want to roll out this system to all of humanity, not just the soldiers, since almost everybody has nanomachines now. It's a lot like how the events of MGS2 were a way for the Patriots to test out their mimetic manipulation scheme, the S3 plan, on Raiden before rolling it out to the public. The Patriots are doing the same thing with Sons of the Patriots, the name of the system. They're testing it out on the absolute most extreme conditions, the world's battlefields, to make sure that the system is totally foolproof before unleashing it on all of mankind. I'll bring up some other plot points as they become relevant, but for now, let's move on. So basically, this whole game's story is about an AI cluster's scheme to control the population's senses, and the lesson of the gameplay is that our senses are incredibly valuable. Fear, exhaustion, natural unexpected combat highs, and a cause worth fighting for are the things that make Snake such an effective soldier, both in gameplay and in the story. He's able to feel things in a way that the people around him just aren't anymore because of their nanomachines. He doesn't get hit with sudden PTSD when his nanomachines are shut off because he's been facing the reality of combat for his entire life, long before nanomachines were invented. He's stronger than anyone else in this game because he isn't relying on artificial enhancements to his senses. He's just using honest-to-god intuition combined with a sharp focus and a genuine sense of fear to make a joke out of the enemy's defenses. I'm not talking about the story here either. This is what we, the players, have to do to succeed on the harder skill levels. Use our senses. What's so cool about all of this is that they've completely upgraded the nature of MGS gameplay with this new sense-focused gameplay. And then they've made the core feeling of the gameplay something that the main antagonist, the Patriots, specifically wants to control and manipulate. Every time you hear a guard's footsteps and turn your octo camera on to fullest senses, you, as a player, are spitting in the face of everything that the Patriots are trying to do, and that's just <laughs> awesome. However, this is a sequel to MGS3. Sure, it takes place 50 years after that game, but it's the next one in the series. MGS3 was about Naked Snake learning to believe in a cause and carry feelings and passion onto the battlefield so as to not just be a mindless soldier, but by the end of the game, he learns that the New World Order would be one that wants soldiers to be mindless. MGS4 is almost an inverted version of that, or at least a sequel to that character arc. There's a reason that I like to refer to all of the Snake player characters as being a single person. Naked Snake's character arc in MGS3 leads into Old Snake's character arc in MGS4, even though they're technically two different people. Well, from the very start of MGS4, Old Snake has a cause he believes in. He does carry his emotions onto the battlefield. Remember, this is the guy who harbored Sonny from the Patriots and started an anti-Metal Gear NGO philanthropy, and who cares genuinely deeply about Otacon and Campbell and Raiden. He's the guy who basically explained the meaning of life to Raiden at the end of MGS2. 
Old Snake at the start of this game is everything that Naked Snake could have turned into if the world after the Cold War allowed him to bloom in that way. Only this time, the world isn't heading to one where that kind of passion is frowned upon. No, in MGS4, the world has already become that. Snake is the odd one out for having these feelings and passions. Everyone around him essentially greets his philosophies on what makes a soldier a soldier with, okay boomer. They don't understand Snake's passion because the vast, vast majority of active armies don't have a nation or ideology or a sense of passion to begin with. MGS4 is about the world that Big Boss left behind, and that's a world that doesn't need snakes. This is, if you ask me, the main reason that Solid Snake is called Old Snake in this game. He's a relic of the past, and he doesn't fit in on these clean, emotionless battlefields. The world is rejecting Snake, and this leads us to our next big plot point. Snake is going through accelerated aging basically clone decay. He's not going to be around for much longer than six months, and with him gone, the world will very quickly forget about how things were before the nanomachines started controlling everything. His accelerated aging is the last symbol of a dying perspective, and on top of that, Snake, pretty early in this game, learns that the fox die in his system, the virus that was engineered to target specific people like Liquid and Metal Gear Solid 1, has been slowly mutating over the years, and in about three months, it's going to have mutated to the point of targeting random individuals and giving them fatal heart attacks. Snake's about to become the most dangerous weapon of mass destruction ever conceived. And so, we spend the entire game with both Snake and the player thinking that this whole thing is going to end in his suicide. This is grim as hell, especially for a Metal Gear game. Snake's being forced to leave the world behind, just as it evolves to the point where it no longer even wants him. The world's going to descend into an utter absence of humanity and self, and people who care about anything real will soon be extinct. You've been led back to war by something less than real. That grimness carries itself throughout the entire game. This is easily the darkest Metal Gear game, even disregarding those plot points. And so when Metal Gear Solid 4 becomes the first game in the series to get an unambiguously happy ending, it hits so much harder. See, Snake's mission was never to destroy the Patriots or stop their plans or anything. His mission was just to stop Liquid from hijacking the AIs. He didn't know it, but he was put on this mission specifically by the Patriots in order to help them deal with Liquid. He was essentially fighting for all of that awful stuff that the Patriots were planning. However, the virus that Snake uploads into GW to stop Liquid was secretly programmed by Naomi to target the entire Patriots network. In the final moments of the game, we realize that we've just stopped all of the stuff that the Patriots were going to do. We destroyed the war economy, we destroyed the constant manipulation of soldiers and the plans to implement that system into the rest of humanity. Essentially, we gave all of humanity a chance to wake up, just in time for Snake to kill himself, knowing that finally he can say that he's leaving a good, hopeful world behind. However, in one last plot twist, Snake learns that he doesn't have to commit suicide. It'd take a lot of explaining to get into it, but basically, the mutated fox die in his system isn't actually a threat to humanity, as it's being replaced by a younger, less mutated version of fox die that was injected with him earlier in the game. He's not going to become a biological weapon. He still only has about five months to live due to his accelerated aging but Snake finally gets to return to his ride off into the sunset that ended MGS1. The whole point of that game's ending was that Snake didn't know how much time he had left, and so he decided to just live for himself for once and stop fighting. MGS2 got way too meta for that to stay true about Snake, but much like in MGS1, MGS4 ends with a very simple message being spoken to Snake. For you to put aside the gun and live. Live, Snake. You have to live. It's way, way more nuanced, but just like in the original ending to Snake's story, he doesn't have to live as Snake anymore. He gets to live the rest of his life as David. Only this time, the series wouldn't last long enough for his happy ending to get retconned. <sighs> that really feels like a segue into MGSV, and yes, it is called V and not 5, but we aren't quite ready to go there yet. While I'm on the topic though, just to give you a quick breather after what felt like a conclusion, I've decided that I'm not going to be covering Peace Walker in this series. 
I know it's ironic because other than, I guess, Police Knots and Snatcher, that's the only Kojima-directed game that I haven't already made a video on beforehand, but re-examining it, it just doesn't really belong in this series of videos. I'm sure I'll do a video on it someday, but look, it's a side game. It isn't that important to, well, anything that I'm talking about in this series. Sure, it's fun and all around really good, but hopefully you get me. Truth be told, I wasn't all that sure if I wanted to include MGSV in this video either. It's a little fuzzy. Obviously the V in the title refers to Venom Snake, which makes me want to categorize it as another side game, but that V also really looks like it represents a 5. The finality of MGS4's ending, combined with the plot passiveness of MGSV, just makes it feel like it's not an ending to the series, any more than Peace Walker did. MGS4, as far as I'm concerned, is the ending to the series. However, V, unlike Peace Walker, is still pretty relevant to the overall point of this video series. We'll also be covering Ground Zeroes, considering Hideo Kojima made one of the most famous horror games of all time and gave it away for free, I think it's safe to assume that he wanted Ground Zeroes to be free, or at least included in MGSV, but Konami had other plans. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's tread some old ground and talk about the self-destructive side of MGS4. If you've gotten this far, you're probably an MGS Mega fan, and you know all about the self-destructive side of this game, so let's be brief in listing the facts before I get into my opinion on those facts. So the old Snake thing, the accelerated aging, Snake not being able to use modern weapons, Snake ditching the cardboard box that reads no place for Hideo, Snake getting a kink in his back when he does the more modern game maneuver of crouch walking, you touring an abandoned, decrepit Shadow Moses, this trailer that makes a point of saying that this is different from the other action games on the market. All of this really feels like it's there to say that MGS doesn't really fit in with the world of gaming anymore. People's desires have moved on. The mid to late 2000s were an era where a game with slow-paced gameplay and 8 hours of cutscenes was just weird and off-kilter. If it weren't for the powerful brand recognition, this game would be the absolute definition of financial risk. Snake is old now, and it's starting to feel like he can't keep up with the likes of these young, nanomachine-driven soldiers on their clean, sterile, emotionless battlefields, and this game makes a point of showcasing that. Then you've got the whole, this game ruined my childhood angle. This is a good, really good plot. It's the most unique plot in the entire MGS series, and that's really saying something, but very often it feels like the universe is practically breaking its own laws of physics to make scenes happen a second or third time. Naomi falls in love with Otacon for basically no reason other than to repeat EE e. and Sniper Wolf's death scenes. Raiden becomes a mindless killing machine a second time just so that he can reconnect with Rose at the end of the game again. Roy Campbell is faking a marriage with Raiden's ex-wife just so that he and Snake can have some drama before it turns out that Campbell really was a good guy all along, just like in MGS1. Crying Wolf chooses to have a sniper fight with Snake in this exact location, just so that it'll mirror Sniper Wolf's fight in MGS1. Screaming Mantis was basically injected with the soul of Psycho Mantis, just so that we could have that scene where he makes our controller vibrate with the power of his mind. I mean, Eva even comes back into the plot in an incredibly contrived way, for seemingly no other reason than to say a memorable line she said in MGS3, I only get off my bike when I fall in love or fall dead only for her bike to crash and her to get wounded in the exact same way she did in Snake Eater. The list goes on and on and on and on and on, straight down to the final message of the game being you have to live, Snake, just like in MGS1. Here's the perceived problem with that, and with a lot of sequels in general. All of these characters already had their arcs, but now all of that personal progress just gets erased, all for the sake of them repeating their arc in the sequel for what seems like nothing but fan service. Raiden is the best example of this. MGS2 pretty heavily implies that he's done being a soldier. He's going to move on from his own dark past and is going to focus on his family with Rose and their expected child. That's a fantastic ending, but then MGS4 basically says, wait, never mind. Raiden kept on being a soldier, kept on obsessing over his past, but now he's going to get over that so that he can quit being a soldier and focus on his family with Rose and their child. It's just a straight-up do-over of his absolutely perfect character arc in MGS2. Then we've got everybody's favorite example of this game sort of sabotaging the lore. 
In MGS3, the codec team were a bunch of wacky side characters. They joked about hiding in boxes, 007 spy gadgets, and Godzilla, and that was pretty much their main function in the plot of the story. They were more or less the comic relief. In MGS4, however, these people went on to create the Patriots with the help of Eva and Ocelot, who were on completely different sides during MGS3's events. Johnny and Meryl get married in this game, seemingly for no other reason than the fact that Johnny said that Meryl was hot in a random line in MGS1 that you might not have even encountered on your playthrough. There's a whole, whole lot of these contrivances. For a lot of people, like myself on my first playthrough, these weird decisions were enough to distract me from the absolutely fantastic story of this game. Now that I've played again and really let myself see the genius of this game, I realize that in a game with 8 hours worth of cutscenes, all of this stuff really isn't that important and isn't all that detrimental to the story as a whole. If you're a lore freak, this stuff is hugely distracting, but if you're just playing this game, going on this journey for what it is, it's mostly just random bits of generally unimportant exposition in the middle of a long cutscene. Say what you will about Kojima's writing, it definitely has its quirks, and it is an acquired taste, but he's smart enough to know that Meryl marrying Johnny is stupid as hell. But that doesn't mean that decisions like these were the point of the game, they're just quirks of it. However, if you're like me, that doesn't satisfy you one bit. So let me tell you why I think these quirks are in there in the first place. See, I know I've said MGS4 is really about yada 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 about a dozen times so far, but when I zoom out far enough and try to describe the whole thing in one quick sentence, I just land on MGS4 is about ending Metal Gear once and for all. Depending on how much you like the game, and how much you think those retcons damaged the previous games for you, MGS4 is either a meaningless bullet in the head to the series, or it's a glorious and meaningful final triumph that will put an end to the generations long conflict that the rest of this series has been showcasing. I think we're all really familiar with that first angle. I myself did a video on that angle called MGS4 Let It Die. But that second angle is how I saw things this time around. I think it's what's meant by the whole bring zero back to nothing speech that Big Boss gives in the final scene of this game. We've destroyed all of the evil that allows for MGS plots to happen in the first place, and that evil always took the form of complicated, nuanced conspiracies that can have hour-long lore videos dedicated to them. MGS really did become a complete mess of lore. It's way too much to fully understand without having played the games a dozen times, and there are a lot of times when a full understanding is pretty much the only type of understanding that's sufficient to know what's going on in the series when you're playing. Liquid's arm being grafted onto Ocelot was a fairly small plot point in MGS2. If seven years and one and a half games later, you forgot about that little detail, you're going to be so confused as to why Liquid is an antagonist in this game since we all saw him die in the first one. When Big Boss kills Zero and dies himself, he's bringing Zero back to nothing. All remnants of the Patriots are gone. By destroying the Patriots, we've destroyed the conspiracy, and in destroying the conspiracy, we destroyed the need for all of this lore. By destroying the Patriots, we turned a thousand into zero. Essentially, when Big Boss and Zero die, all of that complicated, messy lore is erased. When Big Boss dies, Zero turns back to nothing. It's a simple answer to a complicated problem, but at the time of writing, that's what all of these self-destructive retcons are to me. It's a game series destroying its own lore, going out of its way to make you hate that lore, because that lore is the times. That lore is the reason that Snake has continued to suffer game after game after game, and because by the end of this game, none of that lore is going to matter anymore. Then, if you're still following me, we get the first MGS post credits dialogue that isn't a plot twist, but further affirmation of a happy ending. Otacon tells Snake that all of the intricacies of his story might not matter anymore, but that they still deserve to be passed on to the future. He says that he's going to stick with Snake even in these last few months of his life, so that he can be the progenitor of Snake's story, so that he can pass Snake's story on to us. To me, this is a downright beautiful way of ending it all, saying it might all be over and destroyed now, but 
we've still got years of history that we can enjoy. Referring, of course, to the previous games in the Metal Gear series. Nothing that happens in these games between messy lore dumps, retcons of happy endings, deconstructions of the series tropes, Metal Gear Survive releasing, or even Kojima's eventual death will ever take away the games from you. You'll always have Metal Gear if you want it. Metal Gear Solid 4 is, in that way, a celebration of life at the time of death. Upon my most recent playthrough, Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots didn't feel like a bullet to the head for the series. It felt like a dignified death and a celebration of all the fantastic experiences that the series has brought to its audience. Metal Gear Solid 4 wrapped up the MGS series perfectly. There were no more plot holes, no more villains left to kill, no real way for a Metal Gear plotline to ever happen again. However, there's one more debatably mainline MGS game that came after. This is the one that really hurt for a lot of people. It's the one that left us all with a phantom pain. A very common narrative, and again, one that I myself have puppeted in the past about MGS, is that MGS4 was a bullet to the head for the series, and MGSV was a post-mortem autopsy, an examination of what exactly killed the series. While I definitely think that there's some validity to that, I don't think I want to use that language anymore. Bullet in the head, autopsy, post-mortem, it all sounds so... negative. It's language that denies the simple fact that both of these are incredible games, with so, so much going on for them. Replaying them, these two games don't feel at all like they hate Metal Gear. Instead, MGS4 feels like a teary-eyed but hopeful goodbye to a series that touched all of our lives so much. And MGSV feels like, I don't know, a, a guide on what we should do with the rest of the series now that we aren't getting any more lore. See. MGSV really doesn't introduce much lore to the series. It's not MGS2's examination of how society was impacted by the events of the last three games. It's not MGS3's explanation of how Big Boss got to thinking the way he did. It's not MGS4's recontextualization of the entire series' lore. The only bit of lore in MGSV that's actually relevant to the rest of the series is Big Boss actually had a doppelganger, Venom Snake, and that's who you fought in Outer Heaven. Then you fought the real big boss in Zanzibar Land. And even that single fact isn't really relevant to the plot of Metal Gear Solid, just Metal Gear. It slightly recontextualizes those two MSX games, Metal Gear 1 and 2, which were so light on story that I doubt anyone even thought about the fact that we seemingly killed Big Boss twice. Other than that, I mean, Ocelot, Kaz, Zero, Amanda, Huey, Volgan, Liquid Snake, Psycho Mantis, all that happens with them is we see another chapter of their lives that only slightly recontextualizes some of their actions. Psylanthropus, Code Talker, The Vocal Cord Parasite, XOF, Quiet, Diamond Dogs, all the other PMCs, none of these things really have anything to do with the events of the other games. It's not the key event that sets the rest of the series in motion, that was MGS3. MGSV is kind of just a story in the Metal Gear universe separate from the rest of the series lore. So again, MGSV feels to me like it acknowledges that there isn't really much room to fit any more lore in the lives of these recurring characters. They don't really need any more lore. So instead of expanding on the lore so much, MGSV expands on the themes of the rest of the series. Like I said above, I view it as almost a guide on what we should do with the rest of the series, now that it's all over. Now that the story of the snake lineage, both genetic and mimetic, has ended. We'll get into that, and talk about how the whole phantom pain argument fits into that idea. But first, let's recap the actual story. This won't take too long, in classic Metal Gear fashion, the story portrays itself as being much more complicated than it actually is. 
basically a long time ago, this guy Skullface was living as a child in this small village when it was attacked by the U.S. government for helping to supply their enemies with weapons. Their factory was bombed, Skullface suffered horrible burns, and the language of his people was lost to time. He was the sole survivor of his people, and he couldn't even speak their language anymore. So he swore revenge on Zero, the man who created the Patriots with the Philosopher's Legacy that Ocelot secured in MGS3, and essentially ran the US government from the shadows. In order to get his revenge, he first took down the man who, albeit unknowingly, helped Zero the most, Big Boss. Under the guise of a UN nuclear weapons inspection, Zero and his XOF unit defected from the Patriots, who were called Cypher at the time, and attacked Mother Base, Big Boss's first iteration of the concept of a mercenary nation, the precursor to Outer Heaven. In order to make sure that the attack went smoothly, he captured Paz and Chico, two people who had a lot of information they could leak about Mother Base, in order to coerce Big Boss into rescuing them so that he wouldn't be present to defend Mother Base during the attack. Paz had a bomb inside of her, and that bomb put Big Boss's onboard medic into a coma and severely handicapped Kazuhira Miller. After this, Kaz started up Diamond Dogs, another spiritual predecessor to Outer Heaven, while Ocelot guarded the medic during his coma. Ocelot and Big Boss were working to use psychotherapy and suggestion on the medic, in order to basically trick him into thinking that he was Big Boss. He'd act as a second Big Boss, dubbed Venom Snake, and draw all of the world's ire while building up his mercenary nation, Outer Heaven, so that the real Big Boss could lay low for a bit and build his power in the shadows. During Venom Snake's coma, Zero began creating the AIs that would go on to be known as the Patriots. Skullface understood that all of the Patriots' plans, the plans that we dismantled in MGS2 and 4, relied on language manipulation, basically some 1984 doublespeak stuff. Specifically, they relied on the English language, the world's lingua franca, or most universally spoken language. So Skullface channeled his hatred that came from losing his own language and crafted a plan to use a vocal cord parasite to kill anyone in the world that spoke English. He would eradicate the world's lingua franca and the language that the Patriots operated on, both to get revenge on Zero for all the bad stuff in Skullface's life that he represented, and he destroyed Zero's plans for social domination of the world by severing the world's nations socially from each other. Destroy the English language, and you can destroy the S3 plan before it was ever even started. Skullface wanted to replace a common tongue for the people on Earth with a language of deterrence. He wanted to put the first iterations of Metal Gear in the spotlight so that every small nation and organization would soon have their own nuclear capabilities, and small cultures like the one he lost wouldn't have to fear eradication at the hands of world superpowers like the US government. Venom Snake stopped Skullface's plans, indirectly helping Cypher to make sure that the S3 plan could happen all those years later, though neither Cypher nor Venom would have known that that's what it would have led to. And that's pretty much the story. As you can hear in this cassette in Ground Zeroes, Kaz turns out to have always been against Big Boss, seeing as he was there helping to put the bomb inside of Paz. Give the shot already! That'd be the voice of Kazuhira Miller's voice actor, and in the Japanese version of this game, Miller's Japanese VA says this line too, so it's no mere coincidence. I guess he was working for Cypher or something, but that doesn't really matter right now. Okay, so I guess the story's a little bit more complicated than I let on, but hopefully we're all on the same page now, because you can easily play through all of MGSV and only get the absolute surface level of what's going on if you aren't paying frankly way more attention than is reasonable. I gotta say, I really hate explaining MGS plotlines. It's never as simple as it is in my head, but it had to be done. Now that we're on the same page about what it is, we can talk about the real reason that this video exists. What it means. If you've been paying super close attention over this video series, you'll have noticed that MGS2 and its events came up a whole lot during that plot synopsis just now. Skullface predicted that the S3 plan, or something similar, could happen in the future and wanted to eradicate the English language to prevent that eventuality. He's talking about creating a world where every small faction has its own nuclear force. And now every state, group, and dot-com has its own version of Metal Gear. Not exactly a classified weapon for today's nuclear powers. Really, more than, oh, there were actually two big bosses, this is how MGSV most connects to the rest of the series' story. 
It's all about diamond dogs inadvertently helping to ensure that the plot of MGS2, the S3 plan, went off without a hitch, by stopping the one man who was trying to prevent it before it started. Well, that's the main literal connection. The connections with MGS2 don't end there, though. In fact, they go all the way down to this game's very core. See, even with the glorious tribute to all that Metal Gear is that was MGS4, and the bombastic action-packed origin story that is MGS3, and the beautiful message of learning to put your past behind you and look to the future in MGS1, I still think that MGS2 was just the perfect ending to this series. It told us not to worry so much about canon and extensive lore and just focus on how we felt during the games. It told us that our interpretations of Metal Gear, what it all meant, how it felt, how it affected us personally, was the only thing that really mattered in the end. Do you see Metal Gear as a series where they were able to track down and stop the Patriots, rescuing Olga's daughter in the process? Or do you see it as a series where they fail in their mission because the Patriots always win in the end? It doesn't really matter what literally happens after MGS2, because, at least at the time that the game came out, we didn't get to play it or see any of that. What matters is how we reflect on what we did get to see, and what we take away from it. It's a classy tribute to the idea of the death of the author, telling us that our experience with Metal Gear is way more important than Kojima's version. One of the main ways that MGS2 got this message across was by ending with sequel baiting for a sequel that was never intended to come out, and MGSV does the exact same thing. When you get down to it, this game ends on a cliffhanger. Eli has the last strain of the English vocal cord parasite and we don't know what he does with it. I've of course watched the Mission 51 bonus video, where that problem gets its resolution and the story is wrapped up nicely. We'll get into that, but the point stands that that just isn't in the game. Instead, we kill Skullface, Act 1 ends, and Act 2 has like, four missions in it that aren't just replays of older missions, none of which have any real narrative substance other than the resolution of Quiet's character. Nope, for all intents and purposes, the story ends at the end of Act 1. This is where we get into the classic phantom pain argument that I've hinted at so many times by now. So basically, the idea of the Phantom Pain argument is that MGSV was designed to give players the same Phantom Pain that Venom and Cause are going through, only instead of missing limbs, we're missing, well, the things that make a Metal Gear game feel like a Metal Gear game. There's hardly any mysteries to unravel, no huge plot twists or betrayals, no torture scene or sections where Snake questions his loyalty, no love interests or daring vehicle escapes, hardly even any boss fights. The cassettes relegate most of the story to a pretty boring delivery method, a far cry from the fantastic cutscenes in the rest of the series. <laughs> when you get down to it, there's not even really a snake. Then, narratively, you've got all of these characters trying to fill the missing pieces of things that were taken from them. Big Boss has to lay low, so he creates his phantom, Venom Snake. Zero knew that Big Boss would die someday, so he started Les Enfants Terribles to clone him. Huey develops his cyborg legs to supplement his dysfunctional organic ones. Venom Snake is constantly having to replace soldiers that die in dispatch missions. Skullface wants to replace a language that's being bastardized by Zero with a silent language of deterrence. And most of all, the game ends on that cliffhanger again. If you look up MGSV Mission on YouTube, the first suggestion is Mission 51. The number one thing that people are interested in looking at for this game is a mission that isn't even in the game. People really felt that phantom pain from this game, and they felt it right alongside all of these characters. Now, it's a very compelling argument that this is Kojima expressing a phantom pain that he felt, which came from Konami not caring enough about the games anymore to let him get as crazy with MGS as he got in the previous games, especially 4. And there probably is some truth to that. Keep in mind, this is the same company that took down PT from the PlayStation Store, in spite of it being a ridiculously huge success, and artistically significant to boot, for seemingly no reason other than to lash back at Kojima for going behind their backs with its development. Frankly, I can see a lot of merit to the Phantom Pain argument, when you think about how awful Konami makes themselves seem to work for. However, I think that that really undermines this game. Just as the popular and similarly self-destructive reading of MGS4 undermines all of the good and positivity in that game. See, I think that all of that Phantom Pain stuff is intentional, even a lot of the cut content. I mean, with this kind of budget and two already created open worlds, 
this game totally could have had a lot of stuff that's become iconic in the Metal Gear series. Regardless of all of that, though, this is ultimately a game about a bunch of characters doing their absolute best to never speak, both for narrative reasons and thematic reasons. And again, I think that all of that stuff is designed to show us what we should do with the rest of the Metal Gear series, now that MGS4 has finished the story thematically, narratively, and in every other way. Put as simply as I can manage, I see MGS4 as an advisory to not care so much about the lore, and instead to remember the experience. To start this explanation off, let's go back to Ground Zeroes, specifically the Deja Vu mission. In this mission, you're tasked with recreating scenes from Metal Gear Solid 1. Everything from two prisoners being killed by Fox Die, to Psycho Mantis causing a blackout, to picking up the chaff grenade between the two spotlights, and much more. All ending in a quiz to test how well you remember MGS1. However, there's something else going on in this mission. All over the place you see these logos for all of the Metal Gear games, the ones directed by Kojima, and the ones that aren't quote-unquote canon. To complete this hidden side objective, you have to find a gun in the admin building's armory, and use its UV flashlight to erase the logos. Only thing is, you can't erase the logos for the games that Kojima didn't direct. You can only erase the logos for his games. Metal Gear 1 and 2, then MGS 1, 2, 3, 4, Peace Walker, and Ground Zeroes. It's all totally abstract, absolutely nothing canon is happening in this mission, but this is one of the saddest moments in the series for me. Seeing all of these games, a few of which have had seriously profound impacts on my life, being completely erased, all under the creator's supervision, leaving nothing behind but games that don't really mean much to, well, anyone as far as I can tell. Forgive me if you're in this camp, but I don't think you'll ever find a person who thinks that Ghost Fable or Portable Ops is a more important game than MGS3. I mean, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance is an absolutely god-tier game in my book, but genuinely important to the person that I've become? <laughs> no, no way, not like the mainline games. So what does all of this mean? Was this Kojima's way of predicting that his series was going to be ripped out of his hands with entries like Metal Gear Survive and this new Metal Gear movie that's supposedly entering development soon? Well, yeah, probably, and that definitely lines up with all the Phantom Pain stuff in the sister game. But in classic Metal Gear fashion, there's one line during the sequence that kind of recontextualized all of that negativity for me into something more positive. You erased all the markings, but every one of them will always be with you. You can erase the markings, but the memories will always remain. Translation. All of this lore is getting crazy, huh? Sunny being saved by Raiden and Snake refusing to just live kind of undermines the endings of MGS 1 and 2. The Fox support team turning into the Patriots kind of undermines the story of MGS 3. The very existence of this game kind of undermines the conclusion that was MGS 4, huh? And I bet that whatever Konami does with the series after this game is going to further undermine all of that stuff. But you know what? The memories you have with those games everything you felt and thought about during those missions is yours, and what you choose to do with them is your choice. Like I said, the connections that MGSV has with MGS2 go way deeper than the S3 plan and the Patriots. But okay, that's just one random line in what is, technically speaking, not even the same game. What does any of this have to do with the Phantom Pain thing and the other MGSV? Well, with hours and hours of lore being the thing that ultimately ended the Metal Gear series in 4, and how all of that lore usually only served to undermine the previous games, MGSV is all about words that kill. For a long time, I've had this shower thought that's always been difficult to put into words. I guess the idea is that language is a filter for ideas. Every language is different and lets different ideas through the filter, but if you have a thought and haven't put it into words yet, the thought is abstract and mysterious, but pure. Then once that pure thought is grounded in a phrase or a sentence, it stops being so dynamic and becomes static. Hopefully any of that made sense. Basically, ideas become boring and familiar once you wrap them up in a language. I've got all sorts of Metal Gear ideas that were really interesting to me until I wrote them down and started making these videos. Now I understand them, and so they don't fascinate me in the same way anymore. This is a phenomenon that the Metal Gear series pretty clearly demonstrates. It's interesting to imagine how Snake and Meryl got along after they escaped Shadow Moses together, and seemingly fell in love. 
that story gets a lot less interesting once you've played MGS2 and have heard Snake tell you exactly how their relationship went. The Patriots, this shadow organization that's trying to rule the world and might not even have any humans actively running it anymore, is much more interesting than the Patriots formerly known as Cypher, started by these six people who did this thing in 1972 and did this thing in 1983 and went on to do this thing in 2008 before this thing happened to them. The former is an idea, the latter is a history lesson. Metal Gear has always been a series that was filled to the brim with language. Hours of codec calls you can miss for your first time through. Long cutscenes with a dozen characters, almost every one of them somewhat dynamic. But past a certain point, the words had killed the series. Like I said in MGS4, extensive lore was used to end this series. All of our questions were answered, and the story ended. So how do you make a game in a series which has already ended, and has such a heavy focus on story? It's simple, really. You just make virtually every character refuse to talk whenever it can be avoided, and you make gameplay where you more or less know what you have to do even if you don't pay attention to the cutscenes. In previous Metal Gear games, cutscenes were genuinely really important to the gameplay. They told you what you should be doing, what pitfalls you should look out for, they gave you sneak peeks at the areas you'd be sneaking through later, they helped you define who was and wasn't a friend, they showed you your character's abilities and your enemy's weaknesses. People make fun of these games for having such long cutscenes, but in every main entry prior to V, the cutscenes really felt like they were a part of the gameplay. In V, though, once you get past that first mission, they're kind of just something to keep you interested in the story, and maybe give you motivation to fight past some of the more difficult missions. MGSV, having 100% of the game, feels like it's way more about sending soldiers to fight in dispatch missions, learning enemy behavior, building up diamond dogs, and all of these other gameplay concepts than it is about Skullface, or Sahelanthropus, or the vocal cord parasite, or Quiet, or any of the other story concepts. The whole series has ridiculously fun gameplay, but V is the only Kojima Metal Gear Solid game that is more focused on gameplay than story, and what story there is all feels like it's just a big metaphor for why the game had to be that way. However, at the end of it all, after Skullface is defeated and Eli leaves us with a cliffhanger, we get the true ending. The true ending doesn't tell us what happened to Eli, or the third boy, or Sahelanthropus, Instead, it's a lot like MGS2's ending, a fourth wall break, acknowledging the player's role in the game and telling us what we should do with Metal Gear now that the series is over. Facts do not exist. There are only interpretations. When you replay the prologue at the end of this game, this Nietzsche quote opens it, and it's about as Metal Gear of a quote as you can possibly get. As you replay, there aren't too many differences for the bulk of it. We connect the dots and realize that Quiet was the XOF soldier sent to assassinate Big Boss in Cyprus, and we learn that we were, in fact, not the real Big Boss over the course of this game, but the medic who worked to remove the bomb from Paz at the end of Ground Zeroes. Much like in MGS2, the game asked us to choose a name in the beginning and didn't use that name anywhere in the game until the very end. Only this time, it goes a step further and has us create a character who we don't see until the end of the game either. Here, at the end of the game, Venom realizes that he isn't the quote-unquote real big boss, and someone, supposedly Ocelot, gives him one last cassette from the man who sold the world. I'm just going to let this play for a moment. My voice could use a break anyway. This cassette literally explains to Venom that he is Big Boss's phantom, but I want you to listen to it from the perspective of Big Boss talking to the player. Specifically, he's talking to the player about how he and the Metal Gear series has impacted the player, and how the player has impacted the series by playing it. Every player has their own version of Metal Gear that they experienced in their own way, in a playthrough unlike anyone else's. They were thinking about things that nobody else thought about, and felt things that nobody else felt. And that's what Big Boss is acknowledging to the player. So again, this isn't Big Boss talking to Venom, this is Big Boss talking to you, the Metal Gear fam. Take a listen. Now do you remember who you are, what you were meant to do? I cheated death thanks to you. And thanks to you I've left my mark. You have too. You've written your own history. 
You're your own man. I'm Big Boss. And you are too. No. He's the two of us together. Where we are today, we built it. This story, this legend, it's ours. We can change the world and with it the future. I am you and you are me. Carry that with you wherever you go. Thank you, my friend. From here on out, you're a big boss. The whole Metal Gear Solid series has always been about what it means to be a human, an individual. Being human isn't about mindlessly passing down your genes, and it isn't about telling someone else's story. Humans are unique because they can make their own stories and generate their own ideas, and then choose which ones they want to pass to the future. Humans sense the world around them and know no truth beyond their own interpretation of their senses. It doesn't matter what is or isn't canon, what matters is how you felt, how the things you sensed in life affected you. All of the lore that was necessary for sequelizing the Metal Gear series, all it's done is make it harder and harder to see that these games have always been about us, the players, individually. After listening to this, Venom Snake, the player, now in the future in Outer Heaven, flips the cassette over to reveal Operation Intrude N313, the first mission that we ever went on in the Metal Gear series, and he puts the cassette in an MSX, ready to replay the Metal Gear series, and this time, remember that no matter how convoluted the story gets, what matters more than anything is us, how we feel when we play these games, and what we take away from them. Metal Gear, Big Boss's legacy, the legend of Solid Snake, the shape and image of the Patriots, all of these things are ours, just as much as they are Kojima's. We have our own ideas and feelings and emotions, and nothing will ever be able to take that away from us. All we have to do is decide which ideas deserve to be passed on. I hope you've enjoyed the ideas that I've passed on to you over the course of this series. Have a fantastic day. This is the second one of these I've had to film today. Uh, you could probably tell how tired I was based on um, how that outro looks, how simple it is. Um, I already explained once today in the upcoming Disco Elysium videos Patreon read why it's such a mess behind me, but I'll explain it here too. Uh, I'm going to be losing this apartment very soon. Fair warning, my videos might look and maybe sound a little bit rough. I don't exactly know what my living situation is going to be. I do have a place to stay in case of emergency, but it's not going to be ideal. I'll probably end up filming in a storage unit or something, so we'll see if um, I can get some decent quality out of that. But the real reason that I'm here is uh, to go ahead and verbally thank my patrons. This project was a uh, huge, huge, huge passion project for me, and it took a long, long time to put together. Um, and it wasn't the most popular thing I knew it wasn't going to be, but I was uh, super proud of it, and I'm really glad I got to do it, and I owe that all to the patrons, especially those who donate $10 or more monthly, such as Christopher A. Estes, Babylon Broken, The Narcissist Cookbook, Ezio Batoon, Spooky Ina, Guybrush, M. Coy, Cappy, Lake, Mina, Eva Knight, Panda, Mr. Kokoko, Shea Theus, Nomad Delilah Jester, Bjorb, Lily Leons, Neris, Sean Hamilton, Monkey Monks Monkey Monastery, Voiced Mute, Haunted Mystic, Charlotte, Freedom Rider, Rio, Laura M, Poof Donut, Finboy Fishing, Atheist, Joannis, IW, Arta Aurelia, Vega Nelson, Demise, Mia Maple, Nicole, Ada Avery, George Rosenbaum, Neurofilter, The Coombslayer, Summer Celine Garnet Midnight, 
Big Time Jim, Darius Fazier, Dennis Valshakamer, Almost Dead Again, Gab, David Kaiser, Erica, and CeeLo. God, I can feel how raspy my voice is. I've been just <laughs> glued to this computer all day working. It's been a 12-hour shift, and I got two more hours on it, so I guess I'm ahead of schedule all in all. But I'm going to save my voice any further strain and uh, call it there. Uh, <laughs> have a great week, everybody. Thanks for sticking with me through this uh, weird series that not everybody was interested in. Uh, your faith means the world to me. Uh, have a good week.